Good morning to everyone. Uh, dear participants on site and online, a warm welcome to the symposium The Born Digital Challenge in Private Archives, Research Perspective, Perspectives and Archival Practices. I'm happy to welcome you to the two-day symposium's first day here at SLS. My name is Kristina Linnovara and I work as the Head of Archives uh, at the Society of Swedish Literature in Finland, SLS. SLS is a scholarly society operating in the fields of archives, research, publishing and wealth man management. We preserve, study and disseminate knowledge about Swedish culture in Finland. Our work is possible thanks to the donations made by private individuals since the founding of SLS in 1885. This day brings together researchers of literature and digital humanities with archivists to discuss and develop archival practices of born digital material. Our cultural heritage is becoming increasingly digital, which means that the archive sources of the future will, for the most part, be born digital documents. The symposium opens up questions about acquiring, preserving and making available digitally born material from questions actual both for archives and researchers. Also, technical, legal and ethical questions are central issues in this context. <clears throat> we are here to conduct a dialogue between us, us archiv archivists and the researchers. I would like to thank all the international uh, lecturers for being here today at SLS and, in, and for allowing us to take part in your research themes. We have an interesting day ahead with a wide range of presentations that give perspective on the theme of the symposium. Last but not least, I would like to thank the organizers, the Archival uh, Research Network Arne at the University of Helsinki, uh, and the personnel at the Archives and the communi Communication Department of the Finnish uh, uh, Literature Society and the, so the Society of Swedish Literature in Finland, SLS. I want to give a special thank to Veja Pulkkinen, uh, who has been a key person in the realization of this symposium. I wish all participants a rewarding and an interesting day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Johan Py. I work here at the SLS Archives, and I'll be your host for today. Thank you, Christina, for the opening words. On my behalf, I also want to wish you welcome to this two-day symposium that will be hoped to be a, a milestone in the discourse of archival practices for born digital material. We are delighted to have you join us for this event that brings together researchers, along with archivists, to explore and develop approaches to prefer preserving the cultural content of the digital age. Today we will have a hybrid event that is streamed online and most of the program will also be viewable online afterwards. And for those of you who are following us online, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Maria Mienalainen and here from SLS will be our chat host for today and she will try to pick up all the questions you have in the chat. Without further ado, I want to give the stage to Emanuela Carbe. Emanuela comes from the University of Siena and she will enlighten us on the topic of inside born digital literary archives, methodological and ethical issues. It's a topic that feels familiar to us working at the archives. Welcome to the stage, Emanuela. This one? Yeah. Yes. Um, the presentation mode. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I would like to thank you and recall my uh, appreciation for the opportunity to take part uh, to this uh, symposium on Born Digital Archives. 
thanks to all the organizers of, of the event and I'm really honored to be here and I'm sure that I will learn a lot of a lot of, in these days of exchanges of important and interesting interesting experiences. In the winter of 2022, I was at the Venice Center of Digital and Public Humanities of the Kafoskari University to complete a book on born digital literary archives titled Digitale d'autore, Macchine, Archivi, Letterature. While the subtitle is very easy to translate, machines, archives, literature, is not so easy to translate the meaning of Digitale d'autore. It could sound uh, like authorial digital or authors digital or something like that. In this book, I try to make the point on some international experiences, some of these made uh, by some of the invited speaker of this, uh, thank you, of, the, of this morning and this day. Um, and above all, about the Italian landscape on born digital archives under an archivistic and philological point of view. I started to study Born Digital Archives uh, 10 years ago, in 2013, within a research team at the University of Pavia. At that time, I was a happy traditional philologist working on contemporary manuscripts. And uh, uh, to be honest, I didn't know yet what big trouble I would find myself in uh, when I start to deal with the, the, more, the Born Digital Archives. Uh, it was a little bit frustrating while I was writing the book to see how many issues are still unresolved and how many times I lost myself into these types of archives. While I was wondering, for instance, how to make a fund better accessible to the researcher. Venice, in some way, helped me. There was no better place to, place to rethink about this type of archives than a place without a center, with an infinity of connection Above, above and under the water, where you can get lost everywhere and where Google Maps is not really a good idea to be sure about where you go, and where the fluxus of the water decides the architectural vision of the city as much as the invisible stream of bits defines the shape, the architecture of our digital memories. Ted Nelson, interviewed by Werner Herzog for the documentary Lo and Behold, told that he starts to think about relationships and structures when he was a child on a boat on the lake with, the, with his grandparents. And putting his hand into the water, he realized that the water began to flow between his fingers, opening and closing, creating a system of ever-changing relations. It is maybe only a suggestive story, but there is a fundamental truth. Digital objects has always to do with the fluidity and interconnections, and born digital archives must consider the fluidity as a starting point, and I also add as an ending point if we consider how to make accessible these funds to the researcher. To understand born digital archives, one must completely shift perspectives on the concept of a traditional archives. It is necessary to be familiar with issues related to encoding, as data science, archaeology of media, understand archivistic, but also the philological point of view, and to have ex expertise in digital forensics, in digital law preservation, and also to take legal considerations in into account. Essentially, we all know very well that approaching unborn digital archives is impossible without working in a group of digital humanities experts from various different disciplines. The issue of the born digital literary archives, as we know, is not really a new topic. I thought we can say that now is really becoming one of the most trend, important DH trend. We can remember as early in 29, after the death of David Foster Wallace and John Updike, Matthew Kinshimon uh, and other important scholars addressed the challenges of contemporary writers archived and analyzed the major institution working on this specific topic at the, at the time. In that same year, Kirchenbaum was publishing his book, Mechanism, New Media and Forensic Imagination, and a network of many institutions started to consolidate their works on born digital archives. In 2010, the conference Computer Forensics and Born Digital Content in Cultural Heritage Collections took a big step forward and contributed 
to the birth of strategic initiatives that we still see active today, such as the Big Curator Consortium. In this quotation on the slide, there are some specific questions to keep, to keep always in mind. What, after all, is being collected? How can it be authenticated? In what really data consists? What about the sensitive records? Some of these questions, now after more than 10 year, uh, years, have different and extensive answers. And there is still much work to be done. We have some pragmatic and practical challenges, but we cannot resolve them without many different starting points. It's very famous, the, Kirchen, the Kirchenbaum statement, obviously referred to Jerome McGann, of the textual condition, published on the Digital Humanities Quarterly exactly 10 years ago. After more than 10 years, these issues of the Born Digital Literary Archives have become increasingly urgent for the memory institutions which preserve archives of modern and contemporary authors. We can now define it is as a serious emergency for all the university and libraries and museums which manage cultural heritage of our, of our recent past and our present, which find itself more and more often handling hardware and the more digital content of authors in new type of hybrid archives, sometimes with no clear idea of which method to follow. If we think of the first personal computers at, at the history of the web, we have for sure lost a consistent, consistent part of culture, cultural heritage. This is obviously, and maybe it's, it's a lucky because we cannot uh, collect everything. Despite this, much progress has been made. Significant case studies have been object of, of investigation, and nowadays many new steps have been taken to define the best practice to manage and preserve born digital materials in long term preservation plans and to make the funds accessible to scholars. And also some guides for donors have also been published, as we know. However, the impression is that we have not done enough yet. And those who have actually de dealt with the born digital archive know well the many problems that need to be addressed. This in, in turn slows down the possibility of providing a really access of the, this cultural heritage, which is in fact is the primary mission of every memory institution. But why it is so difficult to manage born digital literary archives? The title of my book, Digitale d'Autore, starts with a reflection of the, this Kirchenbaum textual condition, trying to provide a, defici a definition of what we are managing uh, with the, uh, in the digital funds, which results in extraordinarily big and complex archives uh, and an unprecedented range of different cases in the history of the archives. So I try to define Digitale d'Autore in this way. An entity or an aggregation of entities instantiated on a digital medium by an author and or by authors producing contents in interrelation with an author within a specific context. The entities, as well as any relationship between entities, can constitute the events of the archive. It seems to be a little difficult, but it, in fact, it's very easy. So, the Digitale d'Autore encompasses, in my opinion, digital materials, for example, stored by cloud platform or in mass memory, of devices uh, originated or modificated, modified sorry, by the author, for instance, uh, photos, text documents, audio, video, but also uh, computer configurations, and so on. Materials originated or modified by third parties when in relation with the author. Uh, for instance, a draft with correction from an author, an author's draft with comments from an editor, and so on. Materials downloaded from the web onto a device. For instance, a page from an online encyclopedia, encyclopedia saved locally on, uh, on a uh, device, but also all the materials online, which may also include conversation with other parties, threads, threads on a website, a forum, a social network, emails, instant messaging, and so on. Each entity is instantiated 
in a specific time and in a specific space. This with context and location references, and we know that uh, uh, they are not always uh, correct, co correctly preserved. It constitutes an event, only an event of the archive, only a specific moment of the, that entity is represented. Consequ consequently, the memory institutions as archives, libraries, and museums is handling digital autore that we, which in handling digital autore are preserving only the photograph of a specific moment, the hic et nunc. In fact, it is a process not so dissimilar to that of the traditional manuscripts archive, but in practice, uh, it, it really produces profound, pr profoundly different archives. Although the OIS reference model doesn't fully align with the challenges posed by the literary or digital literary archives, I believe it still serves as an excellent starting point, at least for delineating some fundamental issues. They can uh, be categorized into the data ingest from a producer uh, to an institution, the phase of ingestion, and the phase of uh, management of this uh, data with the life cycle of this data into the archive uh, institution and uh, with the preservation planning, the administration, and the, uh, only at the end, uh, the, the part of the accession uh, of the collections. Most of the scientific literature focuses on the ingest and on the management phase, which are fundamental to offer a plausible representation of the con con contemporary author's archive. I would like to share some methodological and ethical considerations on this phase, supported uh, by some uh, direct experiences. The first uh, is from Pavia. Uh, the born digital archives of the University of Pavia are preserved in the center of manuscript of the University uh, of Pavia. Uh, the Center of Manuscripts is a very important institution in Italy. Uh, in uh, 1969, the philologist and the writer Maria Corti, uh, which was professor at the University of Pavia, had uh, a pioneeristic idea to collect the manuscripts of 20th century Italian poets and novelists and founded the Centro Manuscritti di Autori Moderni Contemporanei, so in, in, uh, the Center of Manuscripts for modern and contemporary authors. After many years, in 2010, uh, an Italian journalist, Beppe Severnini, issued the challenge to build also a born digital archive in, of contemporary writers at the, at the same university, who received the, the proposal with enthusiasm. And since the beginning, large efforts have been devoted to define a workflow for the ingest and the management of these funds. The acquisition of archives uh, at the University of Pavia uh, starts by sending a guide to the author which explains how the donation is done and how the digital materials will be handled from the moment they are transferred to the University of Pavia. There is a standard contract, um, so the author can also express any doubts or require some modifications, and the contract protects the author who has the last word on how materials will be handled. The author is asked to fill, to fill in an informational survey, and this is a primary step for the best the donation uh, itself. It's not really a, you know, a donation because it's a copy of a, a computer, and it's fundamental uh, to understand the context of provenience and not only for technical reasons, but also for legal and, uh, I add, ethical issues uh, of the funds. This is the theory. Uh, in practice, uh, there are many, many issues uh, on this workflow. Uh, this survey uh, consists in 15 main uh, areas. Some of the questions require an open answer, some have multiple choice, and give also the chance to answer with more articulated comment. Information is gathered about the author's computer and the device, how the archive is organized, how the work as a writer and the technological instrument relate to each other and other uh, related questions. In particular, it asks the author how the archive to be deposited is shaped, if he or she knows. 
and uh, whether there are differences compared to his own personal archives. Should there be substantial differences, uh, some information is requested, requ requested in order to better understand the original archive and the environment uh, from which the material is derived. It uh, asks whether or not the author has the intention of modifying the archive before it is donated, to example, for example, in the directory structure or in file or directory names or contents. And an important question is whether the archive includes data that had not been originally created by the author, such as third-party generated files or emails received by the author. It asks whether the archive is intended to be subsequently incremented with further, further donation, and this obviously makes the structure of the fund more complex as it should be handled on a layer basis, like a Wayback machine of many funds uh, related to one each other. Uh, and it is also asked comments about other possible donations in the future, such as web, such as web pages, social network contents, newsletter, and emails. A lot of questions about the computer use in use and previous machines are also asked. The author is interviewed about the use of other types of devices, such as tablets and smartphones, as a means of writing. It also tries to understand the level uh, of the author's answers in relation to the computer and the archive, and also how the word processing software is used, and how the work with the publisher editors is managed. As far as the writing process is concerned, it asks whether or not the author still uses traditional methods for writing on paper, for instance, and what is the relationship between this and the digital writing. They investigate on how the author relates the, to the new technologies on the web, whether he has or is involved in a literature blog, for instance, whether he or she takes part to social networks, and if it's relevant for his or her activity. This part of the survey is obviously less functional to the archival work, but is really strategic for what I said before, for the digitale d'autore environment. It is, however, very interesting, and it gives us a sample uh, of answer about the changes that occurred in recent, in recent years and are related to writing at, and uh, writers too. After the survey, if the author is, is uh, still alive, because it's a very long uh, uh, survey, uh, the team proceeds with a deviso meeting for the donation, and the files are trans transferred to an hardware, uh, crypto cryptography hardware, uh, to, uh, to be uh, sent to the University of Pavia. And every process is checked by a software named Quando, Quality Control for Archiving and Networking of Digital Objects. And in this sl slide, you can see the screen summary. The software supervises all the important aspects of an, the archive's life, acting also as a repository for administrative documentation. The software Quando requires that every step is com this procedural step is completed before entering the subsequent phase. Every time one of the steps is skipped, this is reported in the systems summary page. And all the system is managed, managed using the enterpri an enterprise content archive platform written in Java, which keeps funds as separate entities. The archival system is based on five areas, staging, deposit, permanent, work, info, and database. Primo Baldini, the IT expert who developed the system, applied some machine learning techni techniques to extract metadata in the working area, and in particular for the normalization of the file, that could be a file text, an audio, a video, an image, and so on, and also with very, we know, with, with very, very old format. And he tried also some training classification model to find out an algorithm, algorithm to determining the properties or the characteristics to apply it in one or more object class. He also used machine learning techniques with training mo models of MATLAB and Wicca. Upon arrival, 
materials are stored in a, this uh, temporary area where they are preserved while waiting for uh, the av availability of an operator. In the deposit uh, area, the archive integrity is checked as well as possible viruses. In case uh, uh, any malware is found, the author is noticed immediately and in case of need, need assistance is offered. But virus are usually only quarantined in, into the archive. They are only removed if a, a file could be compromised and this is reported in the documentation. In such a case, there are particular processes to be activated uh, to be activated to try to recover the file co uh, content, also because viruses uh, have uh, his uh, histories, so they are important uh, to be preserved for the history of uh, malware and viruses. Uh, in such, um, then SHA1 hashes are generated and uh, an application generates a list of unique files that have been to be transferred, which is sent to the author for a validation for a check. In case of uh, after those, the author can decide to remove a file or, set, or a set also of files. Attached to the list, a summary is sent indicating the total amount of transfer files, the number of unique files, and the sites of the entire archives. And the permanent, the permanent area is devoted to the preservation following the principle of distributed digital preservation. The working area is uh, where metadata are extracted, documents are converted, converted to formats that allow for a more durable availability, and older computers are possibly, possibly emulated using virtualization technology. Finally, the world documentation related to the, to the donation uh, is collected by, by the software quando and transferred in the info, in the info uh, area. In the first phase of this project, the project was called PAD, Pavia Archivi Digitale, because it was really a new project and uh, uh, the university uh, wanted just to make a startup phase uh, to understand how to manage this type of archive. Uh, so uh, at, uh, uh, in the first phase, the university acquired the materials from some journalists and uh, Italian writers. The first was Beppe Severnini, uh, the Italian journalist uh, Beppe Severnini, from uh, his uh, Mac. And uh, um, his archives uh, uh, is produced using an, a, lot, a number of um, Apple Macs and consists of only nine folders which have been assigned each a different color by the author. And I think that this is a really interesting problem for both preservation and representation of this type of data, not only the data, but also the system uh, in which the, da data, the data are organized, such as the um, Apple uh, uh, little color to tag uh, the folders. And folders are uh, split according to the type of the work, such as books, radio and television, newspaper, articles, talks, and so on. So it's, it seems to be a, an easy case but uh, uh, with a very rational and tidy archive at first sight. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, despite this, it's a very, very, very complex archive with 16,000 of files and document created using obsolete pieces of uh, software and multiple copies of the same file in different folders. And the same file in a different folders obviously means something different. So um, this was only the first of the, of the donations. Then uh, followed Silvia Vallone, the writer Silvia Vallone, and Gian, uh, Gianrico uh, Carofiglio. Uh, with the, uh, Gianrico Carofiglio, who was a, uh, an important uh, uh, Italian uh, uh, writer, sent uh, some files by email, and this is not, was not a correct uh, workflow because we lost uh, a lot of the metadata on this file. So, um, starting from uh, Paolo Di Paolo and the other uh, donation, we start uh, to compose a very rigorous workflow for the donations of our um, writer's um, archive. Uh, in the second phase uh, of the project, 
we, we saw, so we improve the methods to acquire and manage this type of, of funds. And we acquired the funds of uh, uh, Paolo Di Paolo, journalist and writer, uh, Francesco Pecoraro, and uh, Franco Buffoni. In the third uh, phase, this uh, part group of Pavia Archivi Digitali improved the methods, methods to describe this archive, and I will see you uh, this later. And since 2020, uh, all these archives has been acquired uh, in the center of manuscripts, so Pavia Archivi Digitali can be seen as only as the startup phase project, which is ended, and now all the funds are managed directly by the main center of Pavia. And uh, in this new phase, two other archives have been acquired, that of uh, the poet Valerio Magrelli and the novelist Sandro Veronesi. One of the most, the, the two most interesting uh, uh, acquisition under, under an archivistic and uh, uh, philological point of view, in my opinion, are that of Francesco Pecoraro and uh, uh, Franco Buffoni. Uh, Fra uh, Franco Buffoni and Francesco Pecorato are from the same uh, generation. They started to use the computer in the 80s, so very early. Um, but uh, the way to use the computer and to intend their own ar archive is really, really very different. Franco Buffoni was an important, has been an important um, acquisition from the center of manuscript because uh, uh, for the first time uh, the transferred the born digital materials are from, uh, were from an author that is already hosting an important amount of papers and manuscripts and books at the Pavia Centro Manoscritti. So it's the first case of a, a hybrid archive for the University uh, of Pavia. So you can imagine, uh, like, like a lot of many archives, how this uh, archive is composed in the paper uh, section, there are a lot of print that now we can reconduct to the file, uh, to the file, uh, to the Bond Digital Archives. So uh, we have the description of the traditional uh, funds of manuscripts that uh, is a very large uh, um, funds. And then we have this new Bond Digital part that uh, we have have to be making relation with uh, uh, the archive. And now, uh, some uh, researchers are studying uh, uh, the Born Digital Archives in relation with the uh, uh, paper archives, and they uh, are discovering, uh, under also a philological point of view, uh, many, uh, many interesting uh, uh, parts missed into the uh, manuscript because of the print is only, like I said before, before a photo of, um, of uh, uh, a file in, uh, uh, in one uh, uh, particularly uh, moment. So now, uh, for Franco Buffoni, the, uh, the the group, the team group, is working uh, to integrate these two type of funds: the manuscripts and the born digital archives. And the born digital archives consists of more of one thousand uh, of uh, files and uh, ob digital objects. Let's let's say digital objects, and. Uh, 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 Franco Buffoni is uh, like an archivist of himself, so really prepared everything for the donation. This is, uh, for, for an archivist, uh, is, uh, on, a on a certain point of view, is uh, a lucky situation because uh, it's, uh, all, everything is very clear when uh, the author gives you something that has prepared. Well, Fran Fran Franco Buffoni was also an uh, academic professor, so he knows very well how to manage uh, this type of work. But in fact, uh, in fact, uh, uh, it poses also the problems because uh, every archivist knows that we can't follow the author's uh, the author's uh, decisions because it could uh, give us uh, many problems uh, uh, in. in uh, uh, in uh, um, making a not correct shape of the description of the archive. And uh, this is a, uh, the work on, uh, on the archive of Buffoni, um, the, on, on the board digital archive of, of Franco Buffoni, has been catalogued by uh, Laura Pusterla with a Pad Explorer, a software that we have developed 
uh, in these uh, uh, years. And Buffoni included uh, also in the donation his websites. Um, and uh, um, so the website uh, is recurrently saved into the funds uh, of uh, uh, Franco Buffoni at, at uh, uh, the, um, the University of Pavia. And now um, the University of Pavia is also perverse, um, starts to preserve the social network context of Franco Buffoni. Um, and uh, for this uh, particular work, uh, the IT Primo Baldini developed a system to, re to make in relation the contents of the website with the Born Digital Archives donated to the University of Pavia, because uh, uh, this site is uh, full of, uh, is another archive full of text, uh, full of plaquettes, uh, dissertation, and so on. So, mostly using the Levenstein distance, uh, um, they matched automatically some pages uh, to the con content of the Born Digital Archives. And so some experiment uh, could be done in this uh, sense. And uh, uh, in dealing with the process of organizing and describing the files, a critical issues was posed by the unspecting high number that some funds uh, we found in, in some uh, funds. Now, this is not the case of uh, Francesco of uh, Franco uh, Buffoni. Sorry, this is uh, one. Uh, a screenshot of the software to uh, catalog the uh, the fonts uh, inspired to FRB, F FRBR uh, ontologies uh, and the model and the IFLA model, uh, starting from the bibliography and connecting uh, the object uh, of uh, uh, the archives also with the bibliography and other uh, other materials. Uh, I was saying there are particular uh, not so particular, but there are many cases when, when uh, the amount of files uh, is really, really uh, difficult to manage, are really, really difficult to manage. And the case regarding the Italian writer Francesco Pecoraro has, uh, has and uh, has now also uh, very, very difficult. Uh, the author is uh, also an architect and wrote uh, many novels, uh, uh, the most famous is La Vita in Tempo di Pace, uh, and, uh, which was written in 2013, and, um, and also wrote uh, other novels and collection of poems. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it, he's very, he, he, he wrote a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of stories and novels also on the web. On the web. He, he used to have a blog, uh, and he used uh, uh, Facebook and Twitter in some literary, literary ways. So the digital environment of these uh, uh, writers is really, really interesting uh, to, uh, to study. And uh, he transferred uh, more than 43,000 files. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of material, really, not easy to manage. And the author, stated that he first, he first used a PC for writing in the 80s and uh, used to work using a Windows 7 based desktop workstation and uh, uses Dropbox uh, for the most of his writings. He also makes use of two external hard disks to keep materials and one of them also contains files that are not preserved in Dropbox. This hard disk is uh, uh, organized, this is uh, a summary of the two, uh, the Dropbox and, and, and uh, our disk. Their disk is organized with directory names that informally describe where the file were previously located. For example, white thumb drive. And the author back, uh, make, made backup of uh, his work several times, especially, but not limited to, upon workstation substitution. So we face it, in fact, in a Chinese box style form of organization. And before the proper uh, donation, Pecoraro provided 35 floppy disks with the recommendation to convert uh, the CAD files because he was an architect before uh, Wright's uh, novel. And uh, in these 35 floppies, uh, 10 uh, could not be read anymore, and five of them contained a spanning zip file which could, be, which could not be extracted 
even using an old WinZip 995 installation. And the AutoCAD files have been converted to PDF, and in the process, many viruses obviously were found. Uh, I think that uh, uh, now, after some years, uh, we could uh, do better this uh, um, management of this uh, floppy disk. Uh, while uh, uh, these funds is made by from more than 33,000 of files, it's really not easy to manage and to understand what there is inside. So, um, the funds poses uh, some traditional issues, but also some new ethical problems. First, there was many letters of the writer to his son, and uh, Francesco Pecoraro asked to not open the access to the letter uh, after 40 years. So, uh, there is an embargo for 40 years of this letter. The problem is that he didn't know where was the letters and the file name give no chance to understand and to find all the letters. So uh, it's not easy to find uh, uh, these uh, sensitive uh, uh, materials that uh, he remembers and he asked to, clo to uh, close. Uh, second, there could be files not generated generated from the author, and every Born Digital archives has files not generated from, third, from the author, but third author, and very, very important to understand the work of the author. And this is a legal issue. So nothing new, new from a traditional archives, a little bit more difficult to manage in the digital environments. Third, the so-called hidden files, and the file system, and all this type of material. At first, at the University of Pavia, we decided to uh, remove uh, in the working stage uh, the hidden files, because we thought that uh, the author really didn't want to give us the hidden files. But um, many of us are philologists, and we know that hidden files are uh, uh, very important, we saw many, many examples from Torsten Ries and many others uh, here uh, with us uh, that hidden files uh, for a philologist is very, are very, very important. So this is the quest ethical question. What I have to do with this material that the authors didn't want to give us, but we have and we can, uh, and we can study? This, this is an ethical question. Uh, I remember Kishiman when uh, he saw that uh, to have uh, an, ac an access to a computer is to have access to the li an entire life of uh, a people. I ask to, to you, is there someone who would give his computer to someone? I, I, <laughs> I would not give my computer for any, maybe neither to the British Library, <laughs> because I know what uh, I have. I, I can't know, I don't know, but I can imagine what there is in my computer, there is my life, uh, uh, and also the life that I didn't know. The, and uh, the computer knows us better than us. So it's uh, a very serious uh, question, what I pose. Uh, is it ethical uh, to work uh, with a writer, a contemporary writer, that uh, he's a, uh, uh, is not dead, so we can speak with him? Uh, and uh, uh, work with things that he doesn't know to have uh, donated to an institution. So it's, in my opinion, it's uh, fundamental when uh, the, the author is alive to speak to the author and uh, to understand what the author um, understand of these uh, archives. And this is what we are doing with the Francesco Pecoraro archive. Uh, Francesco Pecoralo allowed me to work on this archive and to check the sensitive files. So uh, it's many years that I work on this very big archive, also with uh, some uh, NLT, some machine learning uh, techniques. So this is an example uh, which I propose in a conference in London with, uh, with uh, Lisa Jailand of NLTK uh, applied to the corpus of Francesco Pecoraro to match uh, with the, the frequencies, frequencies uh, the keywords, uh, and uh, some uh, topic modeling strategies, uh, how to uh, 
understand better the archive uh, without uh, really um, check every single content uh, into the archive because it's not possible for 45,000 of archive and it give some uh, good results. Uh, but mm, a lot of works have to be done. And uh, <coughs> uh, the work on this uh, uh, archive let me understand, for instance, uh, all the phases uh, uh, of the writing of the, his uh, most important novel, La Vita in Tempo di Pace, discovering that the first writing phase dates back to the 19, and also I could work with some personal files um, because uh, uh, many personal files were strictly related uh, to his uh, literary production. In this month, I'm working, uh, I work at the University of Siena and we have another center of manuscript at the university library and also at the University of Siena, I found other born digital archives in especially some floppy disk of Franco Fortini that has been one of the most important poets, poets and essayists uh, and also professor. Uh, of literary criticism at the University of Pavia, of, sorry, of Siena. And the university libraries preserves Franco Fortini Library and uh, manuscript letters and other archival materials. And we found uh, 15 for floppy disk. And some of them, uh, we knew about uh, it because, uh, about them, because, uh, because um, two of them were used by Professor Pier Vincenzo Mengaldo to publish uh, the um, unpublished the poems after the death of Franco Fortini, and uh, other floppy disk was used by Marianna Marucci and Valentina Tinacci uh, to publish uh, the uh, posthumous uh, post edition of uh, the unpublished On Giorno L'Altro, which I think is the first Italian uh, edition uh, that start from some floppy disk. Uh, this edition has a lot of problems, as, as stated Mariana Marucci and Valentina Ptinacci, because uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it passes a lot of fear, now technology are changes, so uh, things uh, uh, now uh, can be revisioned uh, better with new instruments. Uh, so um, now I am personal investigator for a project devoted to, to save uh, all the born digital materials of the uh, university, uh, the Library of University of the uh, of Siena, and um, the first steps is uh, to work on this 54 uh, floppy disk. And uh, uh, for this project, uh, I worked with an IT company of the a spin-off of the University of Padua, who helped me uh, to extract a forensic uh, image of this uh, floppy disk. And now we are starting uh, this new work, and we also saved on other other materials of the other fonts of uh, um, writers uh, and uh, uh, professor. But um, the f the, the, my, my first question is always, as I said, ethical. Uh, is, the, is, is it true? It's true that we have some ethical problems also in traditional archives. I think, for instance, uh, uh, the integrate uh, manuscripts uh, and unpublished material of uh, one of our best Italian writers of the 20th century, Carlo Emilio Gadda. But uh, to be honest, how can uh, imagine how apply some ethical uh, boundaries uh, for more digital archives? We have uh, two, uh, uh, two things to consider. One, the philological, uh, uh, the philological necessity to have uh, more uh, that uh, we can have. And the, uh, the other is the respect of the author, especially if they are alive, of uh, their parents uh, of, the, of the writer. So should memory institution uphold an ethical principle on privacy protection for donors, even at the cost of potentially losing data for literature studies? My answer, after these years in working on this type of archives, is simply yes. Thank you.
questions at this point to support her. Are there any questions in chat? No, no questions. But here we have a link. Now can you hear me? Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm Callum from the British Library and I was just had a question about um, the survey that was sent to the depositors or the donors. Um, I was just curious because it seems like there's quite a lot, it's quite involved. So for instance, they sent a list of files that they have to then kind of choose which ones to send on and things like that. What kind of response are you aware of that there's been from the depositors? Because yes. I know that... Often, My there's people who don't want to do a lot of work. Thank you for this question. This uh, question, because uh, when I was uh, f before, I was talking, saying uh, if the writer is still alive, uh, because it's uh, for a writer, it's very difficult to answer to our questions. So uh, sometimes not all uh, all the questions are answered, and uh, um, uh, I think it it needs uh, to for uh, the operator for. Uh, the person who of the institution uh, to make a bridge before uh, make this uh, donation uh, because um, donation uh, is not easy for the writer is not easy for the institution so we have uh, uh, before to make a bridge and then try to collect more as more as possible the con the context uh, information uh, now for instance, I'm collecting uh, the context information for Franco Fortini. Franco Fortini is dead, but there are a lot of letters about uh, his way of uh, um, using uh, the computer. Uh, for uh, writers, contemporary writers, uh, uh, if we can speak with them, uh, I think it's fundamental to uh, make understandable that uh, it's a, a, very, a very serious uh, uh, process. It's not like uh, to send a PDF to an editor for uh, a publishing. There is something more. And uh, uh, write, the writer must be uh, comfortable, must trust in the institution. This is because I say yes for the ethical limits, uh, because uh, um, uh, maybe 10 years ago I would say no, because uh, the philological uh, uh, issues are more important, and so I need, need, I need everything and I want everything. Uh, now I think that uh, before uh, it's, it's, most, it's more important to respect uh, the writer and also consider uh, that uh, our archives uh, are not uh, um, uh, full are not the real archives of the writer. It's only an uh, uh, instant photo, or a little instant photo of, of uh, the writer. But all the traditional ar archive, manuscripts archive are the same. So uh, the, losing, the, 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 the lost um, uh, materials uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, inside archivistic tradition. We have to lose uh, to preserve. Uh, so uh, I think that it's better to lose something, uh, but be sure of what we are doing, uh, than uh, try to have everything and uh, with the risk to not be able to manage it, uh, and uh, also to, to make uh, really bad practices uh, for the authors, because the authors are uh, first persons. Uh, and uh, we have to respect this. This is uh, my opinion, but it's very difficult to, to, to have a complete answer and uh, a true answer also, because many times a writer like us uh, forgot. Uh, I, I don't think I could uh, say all uh, my devices uh, uh, and I'm uh, only 40 years old. So for a, for a writer of 75 years old, there are a lot of devices and it's not easy to remember correctly. But we integrate also with many interviews uh, and uh, and uh, other uh, other things that we can collect from uh, the editors, uh, the publisher, and the friends. Uh, so we can have a lot of information about it. Thank you. More questions? Thank you. Just a more, a more technical one. You mentioned NLT game and the classification of emails with topic modeling. 
No. Sorry, I, it's my bad English. Uh, I mentioned an LTK just for uh, to work uh, on uh, on the corpus, uh, on the corpus of on the text corpus on the text corpus uh, of the, the writer Francesco Pecoraro. We took only the text, uh, the drafts, uh, all the all, only the textual uh, material, and uh, we try some NLTK classification to manage some cluster between uh, files. Uh, this is, was uh, mostly for the files. Then uh, we had the problem of the uh, websites. For, for, for instance, the Franco Buffoni website, website we used, uh, the IT specially used Heritrix, and uh, um, for uh, only the st to stock the websites, uh, use the work, uh, work, uh, um, uh, work uh, uh, format, and uh, uh, for email, uh, we, uh, the University of Pavia uh, never had the don direct donation of email, but some email were saved in EML format inside this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, digital uh, uh, archives. Uh, so NLTK, it was just for a qu quantitative analysis. Uh, uh, like a distant reading analysis on a large corpus to identify some patterns between files and understand, for instance, uh, where were the letters of the son, if there were some uh, in the list of frequencies uh, uh, of the content, we could find maybe the name of the son and then check the file and uh, uh, make an embargo for this, this file. It was only the corpus, uh, a study of the corpus, a linguistic uh, study. Uh, just just one, one more question. Uh, if you use topic modeling or you uh, you try to find uh, topic patterns, then you won't be able to find, for example, versions of the different texts. Maybe text similarity tools. Yes, exactly. Uh, yes, should be used on that. Uh, it w yes, it, it was uh, uh, for me. It has been a very uh, uh, useful. Uh, to work on the novel La Vita in Tempo di Pace, because uh, this novel has, uh, I don't remember how many drafts, uh, in all the folders. It was, uh, uh, <laughs> it was incredible. I had never seen uh, something like that in my life, but uh, it was very useful to understand uh, um, the, the, the version, so a chronological, also to try to make a chronological definition for phylological uh, study, and this is uh, very, very helpful. Uh, but uh, the slide I, I showed was mostly to identify some pattern uh, uh, in order to classify better uh, the, um, the archive uh, to make it accessible to the scholars. Uh, because in our software we put some <coughs> etiquette, like uh, this, uh, we can archive it, this has uh, technical issues, this is uh, sensible, and we cannot uh, 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 make it accessible for now, and so on. So it was uh, uh, to make faster this uh, uh, long, uh, long phase of, uh, of the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. More questions? Uh, I'm Jörg Hilver from the National Library of Finland, and thanks for a very interesting presentation. I have a question which is related to the digital preservation of these materials. As you described, many of these materials are in obsolete formats, and you mentioned emulation as one solution, and there is also probably a lot of potential for digital ar 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 archaeology and, and things like that. But I wonder what is the long-term plan? Are there plans to migrate these materials over time to new up-to-date formats which would be accessible to new generations of researchers, perhaps over and over again? Yes, the preservation plan, uh, I speak for the case of the University of Pavia because my, in my university we are talking now about the preservation plan. Uh, changed a lot in the years. The first preservation plan was really very different and sometimes uh, we uh, at the, in the first phase, in 20, 
nine. It was difficult to understand also the the type of file that we have now. It's very easy with the new uh, software. Uh, so um, we the, the the team intensified the preservation plan and stocked the the forensic imaging and also the open format of the derivative. In, uh, the, the, the derivations of uh, in other format of the same uh, uh, file in uh, two different places, but now they are working uh, for a, a more modern preservation plan based on cloud system like the digital library of the University of uh, um, of uh, Pavia, which uh, works with a cloud uh, system more easy to manage. Um, but uh, uh, the things is that uh, uh, when, when I was talking, speaking about the fluidity uh, of the text, uh, I think uh, there is a fluidity also of the preservation plans because uh, more uh, uh, every uh, the time passes and we cannot uh, uh, things that these objects are fixed and the preservation plan is fixed because uh, like. Uh, uh, the books in the library and the manuscripts in archive, also born digital uh, archives, even more than uh, the other, has a, a life uh, cycle inside the archives, and this life cycle uh, continues. They are, uh, uh, they are, uh, they are continuing to be uh, in live and to change the shape. So I think uh, uh, that the preservation uh, plan uh, must be updated. Uh, 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 to be sure uh, to to have really a long-term preservation. I don't like the term long-term preservation because I don't really believe in a long uh, in long term. But I think that the long-term preservation can be as, as, can can be done only uh, uh, following the the life cycle of these uh, archives and up upgrade uh, the, the type. And I remember, uh, if I have uh, time. We have a lot of time. Coffee in uh, first at half, half. OK, there, there was an archivist, Ricky Erway of the OCLC. Now she's, uh, uh, unfortunately, she's dead. And uh, uh, she has published a uh, short white paper for the OCLC. There was a project. Uh, in uh, 29 on uh, born digital uh, b um, preservation, uh, also with the help of uh, uh, the network of Kishimon uh, and uh, other scholars. And uh, they published uh, some first white paper. One of these is, was uh, uh, demystifying born digital, uh, uh, first steps to manage uh, born digital collection, and there was a paper on uh, the floppy disk. And uh, she uh, wrote uh, uh, something like, uh, you have to do your best to preserve uh, uh, what uh, you want to preserve, but please don't stop your work to, for the dangerous uh, to make some damages. So uh, work. Uh, obviously, in the best way, but don't stop your work uh, with afraid to do not it uh, in a good way. Uh, I think for that for born digital, uh, of course, we have to to be uh, serious with our <laughs> workflow, but also we we cannot stop everything because we have no the best workflow. There is no best workflow because we have a lot of uh, workflow, and uh, but we have a lot of work uh, to do. Uh, uh, in the next uh, years, and uh, I think that the better ways to create these networks, like in the United States uh, and uh, also in the UK, to create networks and to share uh, our solutions and our hypotheses, uh, also in preservation plan, and uh, uh, upgrade our solutions and uh, work together. We still have a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much for, Thank you. for the interesting uh, topic. Uh, I'm interested in this, uh, these ethical uh, questions that you talked about. Uh, how do you manage these questions? I mean, uh, are there some uh, general principles that everybody follows? Or, or you said that your opinion was. <laughs> but but how, how, how yes. do you manage these? Uh, I think that the ethical uh, question 
it's thank you. It's a, it's a very difficult uh, uh, question. Uh, yeah, the difficult questions is uh, um, uh, is, is question concerning uh, archivistic on a uh, on a side, but also philologist on a side. I'm not an archivistic. I work with archives, but uh, I'm a philologist, and I manage uh, also for manuscripts. Uh, things very sensitive, like uh, uh, like diaries of uh, writers. Uh, so uh, I think um, my professor uh, uh, teach me that there are some boundaries that, uh, if you are a good scholar, you shouldn't uh, uh, pass. Uh, but it's my only my personal uh, my personal opinion. Uh, just. Uh, uh, because uh, I've seen so many things in this type of archives uh, that I thought uh, to myself, uh, if someone uh, see my archives, uh, uh, how can manage it? Uh, it uh, there are some something that I really would, would uh, uh, don't uh, like uh, to show also uh, for uh, research uh, scientific uh, um, scientific uh, issues. Uh, we we have to understand if uh, we have on a table of anatomy in uh, in the hospital. So everything uh, we can do everything because uh, we are on an anatomic table. Or uh, if you are managing uh, also life of persons. In the case of writers that are still uh, alive, in my opinion, we have to be mm, more sensible on uh, their uh, life. And um, there are there are some boundaries that obviously are. Uh, uh, protected by uh, the law. There are some privacy law, especially in the private uh, archives. Uh, we also in Italy, we have, uh, uh, and also in Europe, there, is a, a Euro, a um, there are some laws about uh, the privacy and some limitation to, uh, to study and to cite uh, uh, the archives. But when someone gives you 50,000 files, really he doesn't understand what is uh, uh, giving you. So. Uh, before make it accessible, uh, uh, obviously, uh, someone have to check uh, and uh, speak with the author and understand uh, if he really wants to make it uh, accessible and also or only uh, preserved in the institution because it can be a chance to preserve with an embargo, like many manuscripts documents in our archives are on, under an embargo. Uh, but the, the ethical question poses. I, I, I pose. I, I spoke about the. <coughs> sorry, the ethical question, because, uh, um, in fact, uh, is a fil rouge of uh, uh, everything uh, I. Uh, I see into this type of uh, archive, and when I see an archive, I say to myself, but this type of uh, content. Uh, is really um, uh, is uh, really uh, good to stay here and preserve it for one year, ten year, one hundred year, and so more. Is this the cultural heritage for our future? What type of uh, cultural heritage uh, we want uh, to give to our uh, to to the future generation? Because we are shaping uh, the cultural heritage for uh, the future. So uh, it's a photograph of our history and our cultural uh, heritage of uh, today. So I, I think that we, we, we have, I have no, really no, um, no answer, but I think that we have to reflect also about it because uh, uh, therefore, uh, we we, are, we live in a society uh, where uh, we open Facebook and Instagram. Have everyone give us uh, the story of uh, the life, uh, children, and the private. So we are. It's very common for us to manage uh, private uh, story. But the things is uh, what for the memories what, what the memory institution should uh, preserve for the future, especially if we are talking about a literary uh, born digital. Uh, literary uh, archive. So, if as if there is some connection with liter the literary issues, uh, I agree uh, that we we should preserve also if maybe there is something uh, uh, 
not uh, with some difficult ethical difficulties, but uh, a lot of materials uh, we should delete if and if the author is alive, we should uh, speak with the author, or in in any case, uh, speak with the author to understand if the author has understand what the institution is preserving. This is uh, fundamental. The communication is fundamental between uh, authors and institution. Thank you. We might have time for a few more questions. Uh, I want to ask a question, but you mentioned the, the, where you had tens of thousands of, of files and you had an agreement with the, with the owner or the donor that, that was part of them would be had a restriction. But was this case ever solved and how would you handle a similar case in the future? And is this also something you can filter out by using the survey you mentioned, these kind of yes. cases? In the case of the University of Pavia, there is a contract, uh, then uh, the, the contract uh, is closed only when the author check the list of file. So in other uh, circumstances, uh, like the Franco Buffoni uh, contract, uh, it was easy because it was 1,000 of files, so it's easy to check and to manage. Also for Beppe Severnini, uh, which, which donates 16, thousand of uh, files, it was quite, quite easy, not, not so easy, but uh, the contract was uh, closed. Uh, Francesco Pecoraro case uh, uh, um, destroy the workflow because it's uh, impossible to check uh, uh, 46,000 uh, of files. So in this moment, uh, uh, we are uh, uh, working uh, to close uh, this donation and to make it accessible. But the writer um, is uh, also very kind and uh, he is helping uh, uh, us. Uh, and uh, he asked uh, me, because we know each one each other, and he asked me to check. Uh, and uh, he trusts uh, that, uh, uh, unfortunately, he trusts that I can uh, find uh, uh, sensitive uh, uh, files. Uh, but it's not... Uh, easy to choose, so many times I ask also him uh, what about this file, uh, what you think, uh, and uh, also writers uh, change opinion uh, in many times, so maybe one day everything is okay, <laughs> and, the, the, and another day they are more timorous, so uh, we have to remember that uh, we are working with uh, writers, and uh, writers are not uh, archivists and uh, not uh, researchers, and uh, they have another way to, to think. And uh, I think that writers are very generous to do this because it's uh, dangerous. <laughs> I, 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 I hope there are no writers so, on Zoom <laughs> because it's a very dangerous uh, donation. Um, so it's, uh, I think uh, an author is very generous so to, to donate uh, his work. But it also it's depending on what donate because maybe if you check some folder, and uh, I tried myself. I uh, for to, to uh, when I was working in at the University of Pavia, my IT uh, specialist uh, took my a donation from my computer, from my Facebook, uh, and from Twitter. And uh, after I saw the list of files, uh, I closed Instagram. I closed uh, Twitter. I closed. Uh, uh, Facebook, uh, and I didn't realize uh, really, and uh, I had a master in digital humanities, so I, I think I, to, to be able to check, uh, but I didn't uh, understood really what uh, uh, I had donated in that time. So it's uh, really mm, not so easy to understand uh, uh, what you are giving, uh, because it's uh, invisible. It's not invisible because they are all streams, so there is a materiality, and we know it, but for a writer, uh, it's not like uh, uh, funds for, of manuscripts, it's easy to, to check. And also in the manuscripts archives, we, obviously there are ethical and legal issues, we know it, nothing new. We have one more question. The mic is already. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, my name is uh, Marcus Nummi, and I'm here uh, in a role of a, a writer <laughs> <laughs> and a potential donator. Of course, I have to think about this now very carefully. I'm so sorry. But what I would like to, uh, I'm, I'm going to be speaking here tomorrow in Finnish, uh, but very shortly, uh, just just a little point as as how how a writer or writers might. Uh, look into this. I would say that writers very often are very narcissistic people. 
and, and we, we sort of like to have attention on us. We need, we crave for the attention. So it, it feels very flattering that somebody would take all our papers or files or, or, or stuff like that. And, and so in a way, I think writers are quite easily, um, uh, uh, could, could be, uh, could be uh, taken in, sort of, in, in, into this, uh, this, uh, this don donating materials. But then again, the problem, one of the problems, I, I, I can't go now to all, 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 all the aspects, but is that, uh, and we, as you were saying, that you, you need to be very sort of open and sort of try to explain wh what's going to happen, what does it mean that, that you give this, this material. But one problem is that, uh, or one thing that would be interesting would be to know what kind of tools are going to be used uh, researching this material, so that you really understand what's going what's gonna to happen to your material. And, and the problem probably is that you don't really know, or nobody knows what the tools are going to be. Now with the artificial intelligence, you, we really don't see, uh, or we can't, uh, you can't even maybe answer uh, totally uh, that w w what's going to be, what's going to happen to this, or what, what methods could be used, uh, what tools could be used to, to, uh, to go through this material. But of course this is not, only a question for today. Of course, it, 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 it applies to also earlier times in a way. Of course, we can't know. But that, that's a question you probably can't answer. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, as I said before, most of uh, scientific literature focus uh, on the phase of ingest and uh, the phase of management. But we have a lot also some case studies, uh, especially on the single, on single writers uh, of strategy to make it accessible and uh, uh, to, uh, to make research on, uh, on uh, this type of, uh, of uh, archives. And I th the first, uh, one of the most famous is the Salman Rushdie um, uh, computer environment uh, for the Emory University when they make an emulation of the computer environment. Uh, for the University of Pavia, for now, there is um, uh, a system to make available uh, this file uh, with uh, a software that also creates some connection with bi bibliography and uh, with um, many instances of a file. And uh, uh, this is, depends on the, on the level of granularity uh, that you want on, uh, on uh, an archive, because more relation you uh, uh, more relations uh, you uh, make, more you make some critic acts on the archives. So it's not, it, there is uh, a boundary between the archivistic description uh, and the critic uh, description. But with, a, uh, with a, um, writer archives, you can do a lot of things. Uh, first, uh, I worked uh, mostly on the Francesco Pecoraro archives, uh, also with some tools, uh, but uh, I tried some software, also Collatex and other collection software to collect manuscripts. There are a lot of manuscripts and uh, qu quantitative criticism uh, and the quantitative methods in digital humanities uh, grow, uh, are growing uh, a lot, so we have uh, a lot of chance uh, to work uh, also on big data. So. Uh, the, 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 the true question and what we want uh, uh, from these type archives. I think two, two uh, types of uh, researchers. One is more sociological. If I have a big archive of writer, uh, I can make uh, a work on a large corpus of uh, these archives and understand uh, maybe uh, how works the writings uh, of a generation or a large corpus, uh, in my case of Italian, uh, uh, writers and one is the work on the single writers uh, to um, continue uh, the tradition the, of the philology and the critique genetic to understand how works are uh, constructed and uh, I uh, I worked on uh, two books uh, uh, of uh, Pecoraro La vita in tempo di pace and uh, a collection of uh, novels uh, queste altre um, uh, dove, sorry, dove credi di andare? And uh, uh, I worked on the, the relations between uh, unpublished uh, novel that related with other no, uh, published novel. I understood the phases 
of uh, the writing of uh, this uh, writer, and this allow me to understand better not only how the the book is done, is uh, written, not only the ar architecture of the, the book, but also the meaning of the bo book. Because philologist first is a criticism. Uh, a good philologist uh, is someone uh, who try to read better a text. So uh, drafts and other materials uh, um, allow us to understand better how, right, how a text is shaped and for the uh, writer who are, who are dead uh, is also useful to, uh, for example, the, the post-homonous uh, editions, so the, the edition after the death of uh, some important uh, uh, books like the case of uh, Franco Fortini. So I think it's that a writer, uh, not only for Nazis, but should really donate to the science uh, his uh, work because it's... Uh, um, uh, when, when you discover a manuscript uh, in a traditional, uh, uh, traditional uh, archive, uh, uh, the researcher uh, maybe is looking and finds something and feels that uh, there is something very important in this manuscript. And now things are changing because we are all obviously working with uh, the computer. So I hope that in the future the young researchers can feel uh, the happiness to find uh, uh, some A manuscripts and uh, work on, on that and uh, make reflection on uh, literature also with uh, philological uh, tools. I believe more in the philological method than in uh, software and tools. Once again, thank you, much. Thank you so much, Emanuele. Thank you. There's been some great discussions here. We are just getting started, but now there will be some time for coffee and tea, which will be served downstairs. Please return here in in half an hour, we will start at 11 a.m. with Gabor Palco taking the stage, talking on email. All right, everyone, it's time to continue the show. Let's welcome Gabor Palko from EOTOS Loran University in Budapest to the stage. Gabor will share us insights on the topics of email as digital cultural heritage objects and archival practice from Hungary. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I must confess that I'm not an archivist. I'm more a digital philologist. I've worked in an archive, a literary archive, for uh, 15 years but not anymore. Now I'm working at the University of uh, Utrecht Laurent. Uh, and I would like to address uh, Emanuela because, uh, because I'm very jealous uh, as uh, there are no extensive archiving of born digital uh, material in Hungary of uh, literary legacies. So it's wonderful, it's wonderful that, uh, that you have all those, uh, those projects. There are some experiments but as an institutional practice, it does not exist, actually. Uh, okay. So let's start with a quote, a literary quote. <clears throat> Tom Chani watches as if his life depended on it. The hand up there disappears, then appears again holding a pigeon. A pigeon! They murmur in excitement. The hand gently caresses the pigeon, as if to say, go, comrade, go with luck. The pigeon, no calm, confidently leaves the safety of the window. At first glance, it shows strength, capability, its posture proud, neck held high, tail in a perfect straight line, its entire appearance, lively, fiery-eyed creature. There it is, cries Tom Chani, who had been silent until now. The microscopic photographically shrunk message has been placed in a case and reinforced with wax-soaked silk thread under one of the middle tail feathers. This shined through. The people hug each other. 
Tom Chani, perhaps he who believed in the most, maybe he would like most fervently for this certain study to become something, not to remain merely a dead letter, thus is the most cautious. He is the one who, as they say, doesn't count his chickens before they are hatched. He hushes, leaves his index finger warningly in the air. The animal circles one moreover, waves goodbye. It starts toward them. Imre Tonchanyi watches intently. The, pi the pigeon approaches. We will still don't know the exact explanation of their return today. Perhaps the love of home, this is important. No clearly visible is the long curved head, the long black beak. Oh, screams the young computer technician. The room freezes. The window opens somewhere with assurance and Imre sees a shadow racing along the building, the concrete glass marvel, at a terrifying pace. Indeed, a hoax shadow. Like the heavy bombers, or even the bomb itself, the wild bird plunges onto the prey. It senses the lurking danger, it wobbles, followed by grabbling, spasmodic wing beats, as if one could see the last movements of a drowning person, one who is still sustained by hope. But no, like an avalanche, the predatory animal plunges onto the little messenger. The horrific scene unfolds before the department's eyes. Tom Chani grabs a feather piece. In the forged iron color, a blood smears brown. Tom Chani looks, does not move. The quote is from Peter Esterhazy's first novel, the novel that many researchers consider the most influential piece of his oeuvre. The protagonist, Tom Chani, a young computer scientist, fights to ensure that the central, yet empty, lost, unread subject of the novel, the so-called study, does not remain a dead letter, but that what is written in it is utilized. However, the workplace process relies on carrier pigeons to deliver messages from one depart department to the other. Why didn't you bring it down? Tom Chani asks, unfriendly. Yanka is about to answer, Beke she gestures dismissing, dismissingly. We must follow the procedure. Signature, registration, signature, pigeon. Yanka nods, gratefully looking at the secretary of the Communist Party. The discipline of documentation, she sighs, end of quote. However, the pigeon is killed with the help of a hawk, so the consignment never reaches its other sea. This ironic, absurd lining scene of the novel can also be interpreted as a parody of the social dictatorship of the 70s. The title of the novel, Termele Shiregen, or production novel, is itself an ironic reference to the genre of communist propaganda. What is uh, much more important in this present context is the attention the novel pays to various disruptions and obstacles in human communication. And these disruptions often highlight the mediating role of the medium, the channel of message transmission. Several years ago, I proposed in a study to interpret the novel's continuously throated message transmission practices with the help of Jacques Derrida's work, The Postcard. From this argument, it can be seen that the constantly stuttering, slipping communication is not only and not primary a carrier of po political satire, but rather sheds light on the fundamental operation of writing, uh, of writing and literature. The production novel is not a mere parody and not just an allegory of always malfunctioning message transmission, but also the story of the writing of the novel itself, with every scene referring simultaneously to the events on the stage of the novel and the process of writing staged. Surprisingly, Esther Hase, who worked as an applied mathematician at the, at the Computing Institute of the Ministry of Coal and Mechanical Engineering at the time of writing the novel, and whose task was the programming of production control systems, was already sensitive in the mid-70s to the paradoxical transformation that we might call computerization, that is the transition between paper and display, 
the materiality and immateriality of communication, whether it's about message transmission or the operation of a literary text. But how does all this affect the born digital practices of literary archives? Surprisingly closely, after Esther Hase's death in 2016, in accordance with the decision of the heirs, his literary legacy, including, among others, the manuscript of the production novel, was transferred to the archive of the Académie der Künste in Berlin. So this is the ministry. You can, may see some windows where the pigeon just uh, flew out. In September, in September 2023, just a few weeks ago, the Goethe Institute in Budapest initiated a closed circle discussion with the participation of institutions handling Hungarian literary legacies as, as, uh, as well as literary historians and philologists researching and processing the oeuvre of Peter Esterhazy and other influential contemporary writers. Although the focus of the consultation was on the accessibility and processing of manuscripts, Questions related to digitization and born digital legacy parts were also discussed. The Esther Hansen legacy was brought up in several contexts. Firstly, because the Lutheran National Library had processed the writer's library, counting uh, 12,000 volumes. The entire library was exhibited and made researchable in a collection part created specifically for this purpose with its own dedicated rooms. A special feature of the display of the collection is that it also preserved the original order of the books, so not only its inventory, but also the private library structure can be studied. However, it is extremely sad that the plan of Gergely Prüle, the then director of the Petöfi Literary Museum, to turn Esterhazy's house into a memorial house preserving the legacy was thwarted. Another reason for the focus on, on Esterhazy's legacy is that the organizers invited members of the research group preparing the annotated genetic critical edition of the production novel. The various genetic layers or text versions of the manuscript of the production novel amount to about 1,000 pages, mostly in large format spiral notebooks and a smaller amount in note sheets. Since, since it is a postmodern work containing hundreds or even thousands of intertextual and self-reflexive -re references, thematizing the writing process Correspondence is an indispensable source for both philological and hermeneutical processes, if these two can and should be separated at all. The correspondence has been moved to the Berlin Archive, but has not been processed, so the members of the research group cannot yet rely on the letters from the 70s to understand the novel and its intertexts. That is, this information will, all know, will be included only in the digital critical editions later versions. An exciting, an exciting debate unfolded at the meeting regarding the practical and theoretical ethical obstacles presented by the fact that the legacies of several significant Hungarian writers of the near past and the present, like Imre Kertész, Peter Nadas, and George Konrad, ended up in Berlin and where there could be a technological solution for the remote viewing of digital copies of manuscripts with research permission. It seemed that the present representatives of the archives are unaware of such current trends in digital culture heritage as, for example, the International Image Interoperability Framework, which is of paramount importance in relation to the current European Union culture support frameworks, both the data space for cultural heritage and the cultural heritage cloud, and also in Europeana. Regarding uh, digital born materials, the audience heard very little. In Esther Hazi's case, for example, it was only revealed that the legacy includes emails but a period of electronic correspondence was lost, and the heirs handed over part of the emails in printed form to the archive. 
The archive's technological preparation for processing born digital sources is underway as a built-in function of uh, an integrated collection system. That is the case of an intertextually very dense oeuvre, which also reflects on its own creation. Analog and digital correspondence is an important source of research. This is unquestionable. But in general, the importance of electronic correspondence as a cultural practice for archives, and even for understanding the essence of archives, perhaps requires explanation. Therefore, before we dirty our hands with the everyday practical tasks of email archiving and publishing, let's briefly recall some arguments for the role that emails can play in understanding current culture in general. The construction, media archaeology, the sociology of information society, and network theoretical thinking all approach this question, unavoidable for our present argument, in different ways. Perhaps nobody has made it more clearly than Jacques Derrida, already cited regarding the postcard book, that electronic communication, especially email, brings about a profound change in human history and more specifically forms a new paradigm in the practice of preservation, destruction or the archival. Quote, but the example of email is privileged, in my opinion, for a more important and obvious reason, because electronic mail today, even more than the facts, is on the way to transforming the entire public and private space of humanity, and first of all, the limit between the private, the secret, private or public, and the public or the phenomenal. It is not only a technique in the ordinary and limited sense of the term, at an unprecedented rhythm, in a quasi instantaneous fashion, this instrumental possibility of production, of printing, of conservation, and of destruction of the archive must inevitably be accompanied by juridical and thus political transformations." End of quote. One might reasonably ask why, in an era of multimedia and increasing synchronicity and interactivity in content creation, out of the various coded infrastructures, email, a fundamentally monomedial form of communication built on the primacy of, of asynchronous writing, is the metaphor for the aforementioned paradigm shift for Derrida. When Nicholas Gain and David Baer began the chapter on the archive in their much cited book, New Media, with an analysis of Derrida's archive fever, they pose exactly this question. I quote just this first line, but in privileging email as the contemporary archival medium, Derrida repeats Freud's error in focusing on the primitive technology of the mystic pad in an age of marked in an age marked by the birth of the film, phonograph, and gramophone. End of quote. But not only the arguments of archival theory or history criticizing Derrida point out that email is essentially a cultural practice tied to an earlier stage of media evolution, even if not outdated, a kind of anachronistic revival of asynchronous written communication in the age of new media. Or, as Wendy Hu Kyung Chan phrases it in her book, Control and Freedom. Through refreshing webcams, computers became live, no longer information processing machines, their wires apparently truly connected elsewhere, their window truly real time. The computer screen changes without a mouse click. This surprise, this catching of movement, constructs starkly to asynchronous internet applications, such as an email. End of quote. Perhaps the most influential theorist of network society, Manuel, Manuel Castells, to move on to the second argument about the historical position of email, similarly to Derrida, assigns a prominent place to electronic mail in the formation and operation of the network society. Quote, but what really caught fire was email communication between the network participants an application created by Ray Tomlinson in BBN, and this remains the most popular use of computer communication in the world today." End of quote. However, when citing 
Havelock's concept of the alphabetic mind, Castells argues for a transformation similar to the invention of the alphabet, where a technological innovation transforms all human thinking and social operation, highlighting the multimodality and temporal complexity of the new communication and life form, or the synchronous coexistence of simultaneity and delay as, char as characteristics of the new era. Quote, a technological transfer uh, transformation of similar historic dimensions is taking place 2,700 years later, namely the integration of various modes of communication into an interactive network, or in other words, the formation of a hypertext and a meta language, which, for the first time in history, integrate into the same system the written, oral, and audiovisual modalities of human communication. End of quote. Here I would insert a parenthetical remark. According to Castell's narrative, in uh, 700 BC, the alphabetic mind is born, and 2,700 years later, the information age and the network society characterized by hybrid hypertext communication mediated by machines. Have we not arrived at a boundary comparable to the aforementioned era shifts that, as computer linguist George Mikros recently proved in a lecture, machines can now create messages indistinguishable from the human by neither human nor machine intelligence. Future archivists who will have to process the legacy of today's writers will have to consider the contamination, or less moralizingly, the co-authorship of artificial intelligence in processing emails and perhaps more digital literary works. And here I humbly admit that the literary quote introducing the present lecture was partly translated from Hungarian to English by the perhaps most creative AI application available today, the August updated version of ChatGPT4. Of course, I have, I, I have archived the prompt, the surprisingly good original first translation made by the AI and my corrections or emendations of the computer. Castells is acutely aware of the paradox that although email can be perceived as a possibly archaic form of communication, linked in many ways technologically and culturally to analog postal message delivery, it has had the most radical impact on social communication networks of any of the various forms of computer-mediated communication, CMC. So perhaps Derrida is right after all. Quote uh, from Castells, how specific is the language of CMC as a new medium? To some analysts, CMC, and particularly email, represents the revenge of the written medium, the return of the typographic mind, and the recuperation of the constructed rational discourse. For others, on the contrary, the informality, spontaneity, and uh, uh, anonymity of the medium stimulates that they call a new form of orality expressed by an electronic text, end of quote. Although the impact of email as a primary form of CMC on language and social operation is undeniable, it's intriguing that Custer's book doesn't address SMS, which has become the most widely used data application at the time. And that if we examine the impact of CMC on human language, the, mo the mobile phone and for, for technical, ergonomic, and culture technological reasons generally much shorter text message could be a more obvious factor. Castells does not mention texting at all, while the new textuality emerging from the multiple limitations of SMS continues to live on platforms such as microblog services and chat applications. These dialogues or polylogues of texting as archive and their archiving pose even more problems than electronic mail, and there is no opportunity to address them to here today. However, an interesting fact that Vicente and Rafael highlights is that for various reasons, SMS has become the leading genre of CMC, not only in cultural cent centers like the English, the Japanese, or the Finnish, 
but also on the periphery of the network society, so that its global impact can hardly be overestimated. Real virtuality, Castell's important term, could be well be illustrated by CMC, and particularly by texting. It could be the conditional mode indicates that that is not necessarily true for how Castells elaborates the concept of real virtuality is influential the rise of network society. However, it is much more accurate for a short essay discussing the social role of memory institutions in the context of real virtuality. And with this, we return to the issues of born digital documents and archives. According to Castells, we are witnessing the fragmentation of communication systems and of the codes of cultural communication existing between different individual and collective subjects. In a world where everyone speaks a different language based on a personalized hypertext, in a world of broken mirrors made of texts that cannot be communicated. And when Castells made this argument, artificial intelligence had not yet been played a role in making the walls of the filter bubbles thicker and thicker, almost impenetrable. One of Castells' answers to the absence of common codes and the resulting communication confusion is art. Quote, Art as a hybrid expression of physical and virtual materials in the present and the future can become an essential element in the building of bridges between the net and the self." End of quote. Another answer is that memory institutions must become communication protocols, a task not every institution or museum practice is capable of. Only those, I quote, which are capable of synthesizing art human experience and technology, creating new technological forms of communication protocols, those which are open to society and hence are not only archives but also educational and interactive institutions, which are anchored in specific historical identity while also being open to present and future multicultural currents. In conclusion, museums can be mausoleums of historical culture reserved for the pleasure of a global elite, or they can respond to the challenge and become culture connectors for a society which no longer knows how to communicate. In other words, museums can remain museum pieces, or they can reinvent themselves as communication protocols for a new humankind." End of quote. I believe that for memory institutions interested in preserving the tradition of analog and digital textuality, such as literary archives, this represents a significant challenge. They will remain mere museum pieces if, on one hand, they do not communicate on the CMC channels that shape and mediate real virtuality of the 21st century, and the other, and on the other hand, if they do not create new technologies through which the paper-based legacy of the past and the hypertextuality of the present, including CMC as a cultural product, enter into dialogue within and beyond the hybrid space of the archive. Let's take a concrete example. Reverting the processing of born digital documents to analog pra uh, practices holds numerous hazards. If we process the legacy of emails based on the handling procedure of handwritten or typewritten correspondence preserved on a paper, spam, viruses, and phishing emails and malware will surely end up in the trash. However, as, as could be an important experience of media archaeology, media practices cannot be understood without exploring the dark side of the medium, a detailed explanation of which is not possible here in the moment. Reverting electronic correspondence to the analog practices causes intolerable loss to the archive in an other, perhaps even clearer way as well. As Albert Laszlo Barabashi narrates in his uh, book uh, from 10, uh, 2010, Bursts, the hidden pattern behind everything we do, the basic concept of the book was inspired by a study examining the temporal patterns of emails and their responses. I quote, 
The conclusion we reached from Ackerman's data was simple. Known of the email users in his database corresponded randomly. Instead, their usages displayed the same pattern, short periods of intense email activity followed by long periods, often days of no emails." End of quote. An archival practice that simplifies the management of born digital records, uh, be they written documents or emails, to the protocol of printed documents, destructing metadata, paradata, and other information, excludes the, computer, uh, the computerized distant reading to address Moretti, causing incalculable damage to research. The management of email archives, like that of virtually any born digital objects, is extremely complex from a technological, legal, and workflow point of view. So much so that not only would the archiving of email legacies be an urgent task, but the practice of email archiving itself has a largely unwritten history filled with dead ends and dead projects. Just a single example. The Smithsonian Institution Archives and the Rockefeller Archives Center conducted a three-year pilot that explored uh, preservation challenges with email collections. A study published on the topic in uh, 2009 lists three concluded and not spread projects on practices among just the XML-based archiving solutions. The study itself was cited only once in the last one and a half decades, according to both Semantic Scholar and Google Scholar. Uh, thus, it can be said that it remained merely a dead letter. Despite this, it can be said that major institutions or institutional collaborations, primarily to meet the needs of public collections and archives, provide good practices for making born digital materials, including emails, researchable and ensuring their long-term preservation, if long-term preservation is not just a dream. The email archiving and publication pilot to be outlined now is a project realized in an inter-institutional collaboration within the framework of the National, Library, National Laboratory for Digital Heritage. The laboratory, as a collaboration uniting university, research, and public collection partners, seeks to promote the application of digital humanities methods, especially solutions based on artificial intelligence in research and public collections workflows. Within the lab, a separate working group is dedicated to the topic of born digital curation. Within this team, the lab has selected three subject eras that pose a challenge both technologically and from a data creation perspective when archiving and making born digital material explorable. The consortium includes the Institute for Literary Studies belonging to the Hungarian Research Network. Thus, all three pilot projects are related to born digital holdings linked to the literary discourse. The first project carried out uh, the archiving of relational databases created by researchers at the Institute of Literary Studies. The work was coordinated by Istan Alföldi, an expert of the eARC project. Three databases from the Institute for Literary Studies were used for this project. Hungarian pop popular prints from the uh, 70s to the 19th century, uh, literary and scholarly correspondence and novels in Hungary in the 18th century. The pilot had three main goals, examining the possibility of preserving relational research databases in order to create best practice guides and easy to use services in the future, testing the specifications and tools of the e-archiving initiative of the European Commission, experiment with the large object handling capabilities of CIARD. CIARD stands for the Software Independent Archival of Relational Databases. It is an open file format for the long-term preserving of relational databases in the form of text data based on XML that are packaged in a container file a CR archive. The second pilot project of the lab, uh, lab's born digital team, deals with the long-term preservation and publication of email legacies. While the process of SQL databases aimed at practical testing of tools enabling 
archiving and long-term preservation. This is developing and documenting good practices. The second pilot involved the actual archiving and publication of a fragile born digital legacy by the researchers involved in the project. Lajos Kantor, one of the most important figures in Transylvanian, Hung in Transylvanian Hungarian literature, literary history and literary culture in the second half of the 20th century. A prolific critic and editor, he published some 70 independent and edited volumes during his lifetime. Until his death, he was the chief editor of the Korunk, or Our Age, culture magazine in Kolozsvár. In addition to conducting extensive culture organizing activities in the city, uh, including being the found, founding member and president of the Kolozsvár Society, which aimed at the economic, social and cultural integration of the city's Hungarian minority. His substantial light work, including his extensive correspondence, is a valuable source primarily, but not exclusively, for Hungarian literary history writing beyond the borders. Primarily, the editorial correspondence of Korunk contains numerous interesting and hitherto unknown information in literary, artistic, and social history aspects. Lajos Kantor's email legacy is essentially hybrid in nature in several senses. It contains letters from six different email accounts, but in addition, early only paper preserved Printed electronic letters are also an integral part of the email legacy. Today, we do not particularly focus on these, although their hybrid nature makes them spe specifically exciting from both practical and th theoretical perspectives, as they often contain handwritten notes as well. These are most, uh, mostly draft responses to the electronic mail message which has been printed. The handwritten response was later sent in an electronic mail form, presumably with the contribution of another person. The first task, after clarifying legal issues and signing the agreement with the heirs, was to secure the electronic correspondence received from the heirs and the Minerva Cultural Association. The handover of the emails occurred by providing access to a Google Mail account. The, con the account has been managed by the heirs since Lajos, Lajos Kantor's death in 2017, just one year later than Esther Hazy has passed away. Uh, Mbox is a widely supported standard email container format, which allows the structured storage of multiple emails. During further processing, we started from the Mbox files, so ensuring file integrity, integrity was essential. For this, we used the secure hash algorithm. The algorithm creates a so-called irreversible and unique extract, which can later be used to check on a bit level that no change occurred in the file. From the Mbox file, we then created an eARC submission information package uh, the explicit goal of the Bonn Digital Research Team is to test digital archiving specifications and tools developed and supported by the European Commission's eARC e archiving program and promote their use in Hungary. The Open Archival Information System, which lays the theoretical foundations of digital archiving, defines the submission package but does not specify the exact content and structure. The eARC SIP developed during the EARC project is a standard package format for handling files and metadata to be submitted to the archive. We created the EARC SIP package using the RODA in SIP creation tool and then archived the package with the help of SERN, so CERN's Open Data Repository Service, Zenodo.org. You can see the object uh, in the Zenodo repository. With these tools, we ensured, or at least we hope we ensured, the standard long-term preservation of the legacy and could focus on further processing. At this point, we made several decisions that go against the practices followed in some public institutions. 
For example, the National Seicheni Library tried to promote the use of good practices by archiving a public email list, Kotalist, used by Hungarian libra librarians. The tools and workflow they used comply not only with the Open Archival Information System reference model, but also with the recommendations of the uh, DPC Technology Watch report preserving email second edition, which was appeared just three or four years ago, which specifically aims to standardize the archiving and publication of emails. The tools used, Rodazep repository, EPAD software, mail baggage package, may be suitable for archiving a technologically homogeneous, moderated, well-structured and already published mailing list like the Catalyst. But we did not find this workflow and tool sets suitable for our own purposes. However, if a collection plans to archive and process a large amount of email legacies, their use should be considered. The first point where we deviated from a standard workflow was the selection of the repository. The guarantee of long-term preservation with assured integrity is a repository with stable technological and institutional background to maintain the packages created. Since we need not find a single publicly available institutional example of the rec uh, recommended RODA repository in Hungary, we opted for the trusted repository Zenodo. Uh, additionally, Zen Zenodo also provides the opportunity to share the archived packages in the form of a research collaboration, naturally if the heirs consent. We therefore aimed to choose the solution that best complies with the FAIR principles. The package stores the entire inbox file in addition to metadata and integrity, integrity assuring fingerprints. There are numerous tools available for processing the inbox file itself. For the curator, even a simple import into the Mozilla Thunder, uh, Thunderbird is helpful. Of course, this is only possible after the creation of the SIP package, the archiving of the original container to avoid uh, damage in the inbox file. However, we concluded that neither the free tools made within the framework of the smaller projects to handle inbox packages, nor the robust tools specifically made to support archival curation of work with significant institutional background are able to handle the problems related to our own corpus. The primary goal, for example, of Mailbag a stable package for email in multiple formats is to assist archives where there is not enough IT and HR capacity for email processing. While Mailbagit aims to simplify the archival management of emails, our goal was precisely the opposite, to extract as much information as possible from the available email legacy without resorting to the help of simpli simplifying ready-made tools. Based on our experience, Mailbagit was capable of extracting the most basic metadata from emails in CSV format and saving the payload of individual messages into separate files. The tool's automatic encoding detection functionality does not work reliably for text in the Hungarian language. For instance, it reg regularly identified the Turkish character set. We identified similar problems with the EPAD tool developed by the Stanford University. Conclusion, existing tools are not suitable for character encoding detection, mapping the logical relationships of emails, uh, which is ordering into threads, and uncovering and publishing the semantic network of letters. The research group therefore decided to say as close as possible to the most authentic source of emails, the inbox container, and extract metadata and text from it, preferably with codes whose selective and modifying operations can be precisely traced, so they are without a black box effect. The processing of the inbox container was coordinated by the IT, by the IT director of the lab, Bolaj Indig, uh, language technician and engineer. Behind this decision lies the philological practice of publishing analog format cor correspondences 
as digital scholarly text editions. As the heirs have consented to the open publication of the full text of a smaller subcorpus of the correspondence, we sought to apply the text handling principles of critical editions, at least at the level of text critical approach. The first step was to compare various open, this is, quote, philologically transparent, and box handling Python tools. The research group compared a total of five such codes. Unfortunately, none of these provided enough functionality or clarity, so the development of our own code began, which is based on the built-in email Python module for handling mails. We normalized the header metadata key value pairs, dates, addresses, text strings. The tool handles not only the standard header types, but also the non-standards, if necessary, which can be of great help in creating semantic email connections. Regarding the payload, so the, the, the files of the email, we focused solely on the text. Our, our primary goal was to prepare the text of the correspondence for a digital edition, so we did not deal with the attachments and HTML inline binary files like pictures. We only used the HTML and plain text parts of the email. The greatest difficulty was the res restoration of the character encoding of the texts, the complex process of which will be pub published in a separate publication by Indig and his colleagues soon. The exact recovery of some of the damaged text is not possible with rule-based methods, so we experimented with generative AI tools. The automatic emendation of letter texts with the help of ChatGPT produced some promising results. The data extracted from the MBEX containers were uploaded into an uh, SQL relational database, an SQL light uh, database, to aid philological work, thus ensuring quick orientation within the metadata and the text of the emails. A subcorpus of the correspondence, more specifically the exchange of letters between the literary historian Mihai Ilya and Lajos Kantor, is set to be published first. As such, a digital philological background had to be established for it. As with every edition of the Digifil project, this edition also follows, follows the text encoding initiative TI XML recommendation. The first version of the XML specification has been completed, so this is an XML representation of a single letter uh, uh, with, uh, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, um, data enrichment uh, uh, as well. So names are uh, uh, found in a, in a namespace. The data from Digifuse editions are being published in the form of semantic statements in accordance with the philosophy of and technique of uh, linked open data. For this purpose, we use the Institute's semantic database and we apply manual and semi-automatic named entity linking techniques as wikification. The modeling of the metadata from the Cantor Ilia correspondence was also completed within the framework of the ET data service uh, built of the Wikibase software and following the Wikidata scheme. A possible future European aggregation operation will be based on this uh, mapping. You can see that here. Of course, all this does not mean that we were able to eliminate the anomalies that exist between the TI XML developed for describing analog documents and the email as a hybrid CMC genre. Similarly, it cannot be claimed the arrangement of letters is a semantic network, like, uh, for example, the logic of letter reply, li reply letter could have been easily adopted to the publication of electronic correspondences. Segmenting the letters alone or assigning overlapping emails to one another is not straightforward. That is, 
their XML representation and, for example, an RDF-based mapping present many unresolved problems. The use of tools like the text similarity detectors, such as uh, the tool we use, the Yale, the DH intertext tool, or generative AI can be extremely productive in detecting the internal relationship systems uh, of an ex extensive correspondence. However, they also, also introduce various levels of probabilities and the kind of uncertainty that traditional philological thinking rarely accounts for. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you so much, Gabor. Do we have any questions from the audience or the chat? Not yet. I might have a small technical question. So you mentioned Mbox and, and, and EPED and those sort of software for, for preserving archives, uh, sorry, emails. We've been exploring those options as well, but, but ha have you uh, thought about the long-term preservation of the attachments that are found in these, these emails? Is that a problem? Because it can be any, any kind of different file formats and so on. Uh, are there some best practices to have you preserve these attachments? Actually, the, the attachments are in the Mbox files, uh, the container, uh, in a binary format. So we archive them, but in our, uh, as we want to publish the text of the emails, we did not really uh, do anything with the attachments. So they are secured, and uh, anyone will come and uh, ask the heirs to, uh, to let them uh, to do a research on the attachments, for example, uh, then it's possible because on the, in the Zenodo, uh, through Zenodo, we can share the Mbox file itself with the binaries in it. But uh, at the present uh, stage of the project, we just uh, ignored them. Thank you. Here's one question. My question is about the, um, you kind of emphasized the no black box effect of using the Python tools to deal with the Mbox files. And I was wondering if you'd thought at all about how you could kind of make this workflow sort of uh, durable in time, because with something like EPAD, it's updated regularly by an external institution, I guess. But what I've found when I've tried to use Python scripts to do this kind of processing is it might work for one project, but then down the line when you kind of go to, you, say you leave that for six months and then you try and run that script over another project, it creates problems because it need, the code needs to be updated in order to fit in with how Python has changed or how, um, how this collection is different to the other collection and that con needs kind of continual hands-on maintenance. So I just wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Thank you for the, for, for the question. Uh, you are absolutely right. So this, this is also, that's a other hazard uh, or dan danger for using uh, those kind of scripts. Uh, we know like, I don't know, 70% of the uh, Python uh, uh, codes on GitHub used for digital humanists are uh, not maintained uh, after a while. They last, sometimes they are conference uh, software which just to be used uh, when the conference takes place. Uh, but still the codes are there and Python does not uh, change so fast. So if you uh, apply um, like code philology, you can understand how it works at least. Uh, it can be documented. Strangely enough, with ChatGPT, you can command the codes very fast and very intelligently. Uh, so, but if you, if you take uh, EPAD or Mailbag it, they just throw a lot of error messages and they are huge uh, programs and you have no chance to look into it. And you don't know those. This, I think it's the same with the cameras in our uh, cell phones. So a lot of decisions are made without us seeing. They work always uh, under any circumstances, but there are a lot of decisions and you, don't, you can't do anything with them. Um, technically, there is a way to, uh, to, to prolong the life of the Python codes uh, on GitHub, 
dockerization. So if our code will be stable enough, uh, we just tested with two, two uh, Mbox files, one artificial one and the actual one I was, I was speaking about here. Um, we need to test another Mboxes as well uh, for Hungary. And if it works, we can dockerize it and then you can run for decades without like having to update your Python or downgrade, <laughs> most likely. Thank you. Thank you for this inspiring paper. Uh, while you were uh, speaking, um, I was um, thinking about another uh, different project. It is an Italian project of uh, Francesca Tomasi of the University of uh, uh, Bologna, and uh, she worked on some uh, 15 uh, letters uh, of, um, uh, of uh, on the letters of Vespasiano da Bisticci, so uh, on other centuries, uh, we are in the 15th century, and she started many years ago with a digital scholarly edition in XML TEI, and then uh, the group, the team of the University of, of uh, Bologna, led by Francesca Tomasi, worked on a knowledge site uh, for uh, with the semantic annotation. So I think that the most uh, interesting things of the, uh, this uh, uh, project is the semantic uh, uh, path, uh, with uh, the use maybe of uh, ontologies and uh, RD, RDF um, way to um, make really semantic uh, the data. And uh, more in general for the Born Digital uh, Archives, uh, I always think that one of the poss possibility to make easier to understand uh, a, and uh, work on this type is of uh, archive is uh, the semantic web uh, uh, way and the linked open uh, uh, open data. Uh, just a question, maybe not so <laughs> not so clever. But uh, while we were speaking, I was uh, reflecting on the paratext of the letters. Um, for instance, I, I think to Gmail that uh, everyone knows uh, all the. Uh, the context uh, of the mail. Do you think uh, is it important uh, to preserve all uh, um, also the aesthetic context of the mail? Uh, if it is, is it important, uh, for instance, a writer who uses uh, a software, email software on the computer, or maybe the Gmail online uh, suite? Are these metadata, uh, paratextual metadata? Um, content uh, important for the preservation or maybe it's a little bit too much uh, uh, to preserve uh, this type of things uh, you you mean i i mean uh, you you mean uh, you was working uh, t you was uh, you told also about the triple f and so i thought to myself maybe also a digitized uh, uh, mm, f uh, screenshot of the mail can give us uh, something more about the context of the mail or maybe it's too much uh, thank you for, for, for both of the questions. Uh, the second one is the more complex, so I'll start with that. Uh, we have uh, this, uh, the situation that the digital object has countless different visual representations, like if you use your phone or you use your, your screen or you use a huge screen. It's all different. The, the, uh, the, the typographical identity does not work anymore. We have PDFs, which is, I think, the, uh, the cruelest uh, enemy of uh, the age in, in general. So PDFs is just a symbol of losing information, um, and, uh, and, um, which tries to stabilize the display medium, but an email looks different in every display. Uh, plus, in the case of the Cantor, uh, Cantor Lajos uh, legacy, everything was changed in a way by Google. So we don't have um, an authentic uh, visual appearance of any of the letters because uh, it, everything, everything was imported into the, uh, the Google account and Google made the export. And they also, that's a, the black box of black boxes, uh, Google. So everything is changed. I think the same 
is the question with web archiving. It would be great to have uh, snapshots of, uh, of web pages and uh, web archiving visualizations create something like that. But these are um, like, uh, these emulations are um, like misleading because the different time layers of the web crawl just, you know, there, there, there was grow, uh, good examples. Uh, Torsten Ries uh, organized a great, a great workshop uh, some years ago, and an archivist, a web archivist, uh, came with a wonderful example of a, a, a web page emulated uh, where the weather forecast picture and the data showed that they stem from a different time uh, because the crawling machine just indexed the text and the picture of the weather in different uh, time. So it, I think it's not simply not possible to maintain the, the, the visual out, uh, outlook of the emails themselves, although it would be very interesting, I think. Um, uh, the semantic annotation, I, I really think it's very important. And if you take the EPAD, uh, at Stanford, they can use with English uh, language, so it's quite easy to, for them to use some um, uh, ready-made uh, named entity recognition uh, software. So if you go to, to the, the Stanford, Stanford web page, uh, the, the um, email legacies are indexed, and there are named entities there, like names, places, and uh, organizations. But that's not semantic because that's just inside one single email legacy, although there are like uh, 10,000 emails in that. So that's why we have chosen to use a tool similar to Wikidata, because uh, then people can insert these links to, to the published uh, namespaces, and so different legacies of published by different institutions can then uh, connect, uh, make nodes of, uh, of the email parts and metadata as well. All right, we still have one minute for short questions, if there are any. If not, okay, one more, one, one short. <laughs> uh, just uh, a curiosity, how about uh, the reply of uh, a mail? So the mail with uh, replies, the how, how you, you manage in XMLTI if you have some of these uh, problems? Because there is a mail inside a mail. Yes, and, and, and another, and another, yes. and another. And I have wonderful uh, uh, examples for that. Uh, the different uh, mail servers change uh, the reply text, distorts uh, sometimes. So with a simple similarity search, so those texts are not identical in the thread. It's impossible to trace. <laughs> so this is, there, there is probability we, we can, so a final solution there won't be. So a, a, a very strict uh, semantic connection that this is a reply. Sometimes you can do that, but in most time, times there is just a probability a level of, of probability, which is very, very hard to, to code in a, in a database which is built from semantic, uh, semantic uh, statements. So this is a problem which is very hard to solve, and we haven't solved it. Thank you. All right, once again, thank you very much, Gabor. We have come halfway through the... We have come halfway through the program and we have now have a time for lunch. Lunch will be at the own expense for the audience. And then we will continue at uh, one, uh, uh, sorry, half, uh, half past one with Callum McKean taking the stage from British Library. Enjoy your lunch.
Okay, everyone, it's time to continue on our journey through the Digital Born Challenges. I have the honor of, of calling to the stage Callum McKean. He comes from the British Library, where he is lead curator for Born Digital Archives and Manuscript. He will shed light on the topic Born Digital Archives at the British Library, Caption, Description and Access. Welcome to the stage, Callum. Hi everyone. So yeah, my name is Callum. I'm from the British Library in London. Um, I'm the lead curator for Born Digital Archives and Manuscripts. So within a big institution like the British Library, I sit within contemporary British collections, which collects everything from the UK Web Archive um, to contemporary British publications, um, sound and vision stuff as well, but also includes archives and manuscripts. And within that team, I specifically look after the uh, contemporary archives and manuscripts that are born digital with no analog equivalent. So my presentation today is going to be structured in terms of, first I'm going to outline some questions, then I'm going to go through what the current workflow at the British Library is for dealing with these collections. It's not a static workflow, I think as the earlier presentations have outlined, these need to be kind of flexible and adapt to how um, we're dealing with the continued evolution of the challenges we're facing. Um, at the end of every stage of the workflow, I'll give a few examples of some of the major challenges that we're facing in relation to that stage of the workflow. Then at the end, um, I'll discuss about how we're meeting some of the challenges. And then after that, we can talk about some of the projects that are ongoing that are helping to meet those challenges. So the key questions for the presentation are going to be, First, how does the British Library collect born digital archives and manuscripts, and how has technological change impacted this collecting? Secondly, what do we do with our collections in order to ensure that they are made available to our readers in perpetuity? Access has to be the fundamental um, tenet of any workflow for collecting born digital material, because as a public institution, the library exists to provide access to its collections. We do not exist as a repository of collections that we hold and do not provide access to. That shouldn't be our end game. Um, what are some of the key challenges that we face and continue to face when working with this material? There's many. I've outlined some of the ones I think are most important and most kind of thematically resonant here, but it's likely that you can think of many, many, many more. Um, and the last question is, how can we face these challenges in ways that are scalable, flexible, and mindful of the particularities of the material we are collecting? So first, a quick overview of our actual collections, what we hold, and what we've been collecting over the past 20 years when we've been dealing with digital, born digital manuscripts. Um, so this is from our acquisition strategy. So we collect the personal and professional archives of individuals whose work has made a significant impact on, co on social, cultural, artistic, or intellectual life in the United Kingdom. So that is broad enough to contain basically anything. <laughs> but the way we interpret it is, we usually collect material towards the end of a depositor's life or career, because at that point, their <laughs> reputation has solidified, their work has had time to mature. Um, so that's basically what that means. Um, but we also use a hub and spoke collecting model. So not every archive we collect and not every item we collect will be of that kind of high caliber. But if we do collect it, it will reflect maybe a movement or it will reflect on the work of maybe a more prominent writer or individual. So we'll collect uh, archives of editors, translators, uh, family members on occasion, things like that. Um, so currently the library's contemporary archives and manuscripts department holds 40 individual born digital archives and that takes up around four terabytes of space. It's important to remember that the vast majority of these form part of larger hybrid archives containing both paper and born digital material. Emmanuel's presentation this morning mentioned that um, digital objects within a born digital archive are always kind of relational and in flow. We have to also remember that another relationship exists with the analog material too. So they're not only relational and hybrid within the born digital space, but they're relational and hybrid to this other entity, which is structured differently. Um, and as has already been mentioned, these collections arrived at the library on a wide variety of carriers. And these carriers chart the history of personal computing from legacy magnetic media that you might never have seen before to uh, contemporary SSDs. So at the British Library, what have we done? So began research into e-manuscripts at the library around the year 2000. Um, I was not around then. 
A uh, pioneer in digital forensics approach is articulated in the Digital Lives Research Project in 2009. And this uh, linked paper here, and I'll be able to share the slides afterwards, but this linked paper here is really the kind of foundational text for how we developed our uh, workflow in relation to uh, digital forensics. The first access to migrated PDFA content for very limited collections was provided for the first time in the manuscripts reading room in 2016. We hosted a user experience workshop uh, to test this access provision in 2017. So we're very keen to have people come in and use these collections on the dedicated terminal in the manuscripts reading room and tell us what we could do better. Whether or not we'll be able to implement ex exactly what they want is a different question because researchers um, desires really change with the technology. So as people become more and more used to things like universal search, we are pressured to implement these things in our access provision and it's not really feasible given the level of re resource that we have. Um, we did implement an automated harvest and, and conversion of metadata um, script for Born Digital Archives in 2019. So that means that we can harvest, collect, convert, and create catalog entries for all of the technical metadata for Born Digital Archives. Um, a curatorial role was specifically dedicated to Born Digital Archives in 2021. So this, all of this work previous to this was being kind of shared between the department. And what that basically me meant was Curators who were interested in this were doing it and other curators weren't. Um, but really, the amount of material that we were getting in, the library decided on a structural level that it needed somebody to step into this role, uh, and that was me in 2021. Since then, I've been working with the uh, British Library's Digital Preservation Department, and we've um, integrated with them to um, add these personal digital archive collections to their minimum preservation tool. Um, the minimum preservation tool is an interim um, preservation solution whilst the library switches over to a new digital library system. Um, basically what it does is it backs up the content at the requisite um, remote locations and does regular weekly fixity check-in on all of those collections. Um, we got approval to host redacted metadata for email collections on the EPAD shared discovery site. So that'll make these collections publicly discoverable for the first time when that happens. What that means is basically the redacted metadata, so all of the data, um, all of the, th the text from an email is kind of blocked out except the proper names. Um, and then users can see that on the Stanford Shared Discovery site. They can get a unique reference number for the particular email they're interested in, and then they can contact the library directly to say that they're interested in this selection of emails um, or this group of emails, and we can then do the sensitivity review on that very select number of emails. So rather than having this uh, methodology which we've come to get used to with, contempt with uh, paper archives, which is that the archive comes in, a cataloger sits with it for two years, then after that it's made available and open for researchers with these incredibly large collections. The idea is that we do a kind of ad hoc sensitivity review so that we're not holding these archives back, but that we don't have this huge pressure to make hundreds of thousands of messages available um, straight away. We've been doing some research into these collections, so there was a Coleridge Research Fellowship uh, which I completed recently, which is on data analytics and network visualization for hybrid correspondence archives. Um, that's really trying to work with email archives in a way that is GDPR compliant. So you can basically remove all of the identifiable information and just keep kind of proper names and names of particular works. And then you can map those, um, map those emails in a network visualization and you can see patterns of communication around particular works and that kind of thing. And the code is reusable so that I can provide these GDPR compliant network sheets to researchers who are interested in doing network visualizations of email archives, um, and they are GDPR compliant. Um, recently, we had a PhD placement student, Ariel, come and work on a Writer's Lives project using Born Digital Archives, and she was looking at the ways that writers' um, creative life has changed at the advent of the digital revolution. So what, is their, what are their working patterns like? Um, what kind of file types are prevalent across what particular time periods and things like that? There is links to those projects later on in the presentation as well, and the slides I'll share with you if you want to read them. Um, 
So these are some of the key collections that we have. Just to give an idea of the variety of content, it's not just writers, um, and that's quite important to us. It's also scientists, activists, publishers, different kinds of groups. So Carmen Khalil is the founder of Virago Press, a very influential feminist press in the UK. Um, then we have a variety of poets, novelists, screenwriters, but we also have evolutionary biologists, developmental bio biologists, cyberneticists, and people like that, whose work is very different to how you literary creators work. It uses specialized software, it uses data sets, um, but it's important to capture the development of these very kind of nascent, um, nascent areas of study and then be able to study them historically too. So how has our collecting changed over time? So here's two graphs. The one on the left shows how our collecting of uh, paper archives has changed within hybrid archives. So these are the amount of archive boxes within our hybrid archives. And you can see that there's no kind of steady pattern there. Um, some years we collect a lot, some years we collect very little. That's because we're not like collecting things through legal deposit. These are, de these are purchases, these are donations. Some archives are bigger than others. But there's no kind of discernible pattern. And really, in 2023, we end up basically in the same position we were in in 1994 in this graph. Whereas for hybrid archives, in terms of the gigabytes that we're collecting of the digital side, you can see that there is little bumps, but then from 2016 onwards, we are really collecting a lot more of this material and it has exploded. So why did that happen? It might seem quite obvious, but here is a graph showing um, the kinds of carriers we were collecting. So in the sort of 90s, 2000s, we were collecting a lot of floppy disks and a lot of CDs. Um, we collected our first laptop computer in 2004. Um, that was the John Maynard Smith archive, who's an evolutionary biologist. And then we didn't collect another laptop computer or another hard drive until 2016. So if we go back to this graph, you can see that 2016 is really the year when that exploded. So what we're seeing is that even within digital archives, the legacy media is not disappearing, but the amount of data we're collecting from these archives is exploding with the expansion of, um, of storage in, in personal computers. So just to make this even more obvious, um, on the left-hand side, this is a very rough, rough graph in which I've estimated that every archive box holds 2,500 pages and each page contains two kilobytes of information. And you can see that as soon as 2016 hits and we start collecting personal computers with operating systems on them, things like that, um, the amount of phys the data in f the paper material basically vanishes from view, becomes so small that it becomes insignificant on the proportional graph. Pardon me. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see that even though we are collecting lots and lots and lots more data, the proportion of hybrid archives that we're collecting in relation to the proportion of overall archives that we're collecting has actually remained quite stable. And that's because the library is constantly collecting single items and that might be of interest in smaller collections. Um, so they're kind of outsizing the hybrid archives, but the hybrid archives contain a lot more data. So what do we do with it? Um, this is a very kind of um, basic outline of what our workflow is. It has six stages, acquisition, capture and preservation, arrangement, metadata and description, migration, and access. So I'll go through each of these stages. Acquisition. So we have to build relationships first of all, that's how it starts. Um, and we build these relationships with depositors over often long periods of time, um, often through other non-acquisition related activities. So events, exhibitions, loans, mutual contacts, things like that. We have to maintain a reputation within the artistic community, within activist communities, within scientific communities, to be the place where this material should end up. Um, and to do that, we need to maintain the relationships with our existing donors. Also, when we have events and exhibitions and loans, and we're always thinking about what collections we would potentially like to target in the future and how we can build a, a kind of public offer that fits that collecting, um, that collecting strategy. We always try to discuss Born Digital Archives at the start of our acquisitions con uh, conversations with potential depositors. This is important. You don't want to get to a stage where you are 
going to someone's house and then they tell you, oh, I actually have a computer, and then that's what you're dealing with. And that's what we were dealing with 10 years ago. Um, nobody knew how to deal with this stuff that long ago. And we are still dealing with the outcomes of those kinds of acquisitions that were done kind of partially through, through sort of like limited workflows. Um, so now we try to discuss it at the start. Anytime we discuss an acquisition, we ask if there's bone digital stuff. That's one of the first questions. Um, then we go further, we have a questionnaire. It's not as detailed as Emanuela's, that's why I asked my question this morning. But, um, and we also do an in-person or online interview to get to kind of the nitty gritty of what we might be working with when the stuff arrives. Um, we try to understand two things through these interviews and the questionnaire, really, hardware and software dependencies and potential sensitivities. Um, and then we appraise the Bone Digital Archive alongside the paper material in situ. And we do this using a Spectre Ultra digital forensics machine, which can kind of rapidly analyze what is on a hard drive or what is on a CD or a USB drive. After we recommend that an acquisition is made, collection is physically transported to the library. Um, we include it on our deposit register. We add the carriers to a processing queue and we store them in a temperature controlled environment. And we notify the depositor, this is part of that relationship building thing, but we notify the depositor that the collection is safe and we ask them if they'd like to come and visit the library once the initial processing is complete. I can show them the digital forensics lab, I can show them some of our existing collections, I can take them through the manuscript storage area and kind of sh show them where their collection is going to be living after it's out of their control. So what are some of the challenges with acquisitions? Um, Born digital archives typically contain large amounts of legacy material, might have been stored in inappropriate conditions. Um, depositors are unsure of the contents themselves. This goes back to the fact that these collections are being made over a long period of time. So I ask them, what is this floppy disk from 1986 contain? And they have no idea. And the labels are often obscure and unhelpful because they wrote them down to remember for the next week or two and not for forever. And they also might have deleted the files that they originally labeled, all of those kinds of things. Um, we're really limited in our ability to appraise born digital material in situ. So our um, digital forensics machine is really built to look at um, USB drives and hard drives. Dealing with other legacy media is basically impossible, so we have to go on what the labels say. Um, and also, this going back to my earlier point, our initial interviews and questionnaires really do sacrifice rigor in order to ensure usability for non-specialist depositors. Um, the reason for this is I found that Writers in particular tend to have quite little patience for this kind of like nitty gritty analysis of things that has happened in the past. They really want to just kind of, there's either, there's two kinds of people. There's either the ones who just want to give you everything and just forget about it. And then there's the ones who want to be involved in every single stage. Um, and I question a, an interview that really becomes as usable as possible, even if it doesn't give us all the exact information we need, I've found is, is more useful. Um, so here's an example anyway, so an example on the left of what you might see when you go to a depositor's house, a broken CD and a bag of floppy disks. Um, and on the right hand side are some of the very basic questions that we send to our depositors. So what type of computer do you use? What is your operating system? Have you ever used different operating systems? Do you work on multiple devices? Um, does your computer still work? There's another one as well. Um, so after, after the material's in the library, we try to capture and preserve it. So after acquisition, um, we capture flash storage and computers on, as EU1 files using a Spectre Ultra digital forensics machine. This machine is a pretty high-tech piece of kit, and I'm pretty sure I'm not using it to the full extent. Like a lot of these digital forensics machines, they're really developed by law enforcement to capture like terrorists and cyber criminals and sex offenders and things like that. Um, and I always joke that ours has probably the easiest life out of any of these things that have been sold. Um, Optical carriers such as CDs and DVDs are captured in ISO format. Um, magnetic carriers are captured at bit level using Cryoflux. So Cryoflux is, was developed by enthusiasts to read the kind of magnetic, um, I don't know how you would even say it, the magnetic resonance bit by bit on a floppy disk drive. Um, what this does for us is it means that Take, for instance, if you have a bunch of floppy disks from the 90s and you plug them into a floppy disk reader, chances are it probably is going to be unreadable. Um, the Cryoflux lets you capture 
data from partially corrupted disks. So it might find certain amount of sectors that are still good within a disk that is ultimately corrupted to a normal reader. Um, these preservation copies are ingested into the library's minimum preservation tool for backup and fixity checking, and the carriers are photographed, labeled, and moved to long-term storage. Um, so here's some pictures of um, the cryoflux creating bit-level captures in the Wendy Cope archive on the left. And then on the right-hand side are some Amstrad disks, which were particularly difficult to capture from the Willself archive. The readers for these things are very, very expensive and temperamental. Um, so it's constantly presenting us with challenges like this, especially for people who are early adopters of computers. Um, like I said, digital forensics hardware and software solutions are not built specifically for archival work, but are adapted to it. Um, really requires a lot of highly specialized knowledge in order to get the most out of these digital forensics tools. Um, you can use them in a very surface level way and get good results, but you always feel like you're not quite getting exactly what you would want out of it. Working with the BL Digital Preservation Department has helped alleviate some of these problems a little bit, but we're still kind of catching up with what these tools can do. Um, Creating and storing bit level copies is time consuming and storage intensive. So it takes a long time to make a bit for bit copy of a contemporary hard drive. Um, you need to time it so that you're in the office for that amount of time. You might need to leave it running overnight. All of these are very like boring but quite important scheduling problems. Um, and they're very storage intensive, obviously. So, and long-term storage of carriers is very space intensive. So the, all of our manuscript material is stored on our London site. Land in London, very, very expensive. Um, do we want to be storing these lots and lots of old computers forever, or do we want some kind of controlled destruction? But is that potentially short-sighted? Could they be used for something else down the line? And then validation tools actually present schedule and challenges as well. That's just a little add on there. Um, so the next part of the workflow is arrangement. So we keep the captures as they are, the forensic captures. We never touch them again. Once they're in the preservation system, we don't do anything else with them. But we do make derivative copies. So after we capture a disk image, we mount it, and each directory is allocated a number, um, and then move to an arrangement which matches the original order. And we call this an extracted capture. Really, it's just a derivative copy of the preservation copy. Archival arrangement activities are only performed on these extracted captures, and we keep the preservation copy intact. Duplicate files, system generated files are removed. Um, this doesn't present a problem for our workflow in particular because they still exist and they're still being preserved, um, but it just means that the file listing isn't kind of bogged down with all of these things that most researchers interested in our collections would not have any idea what they are. Um, email collections are, are isolated at this point as well for um, set aside for ingesting the EPUD later on down the line. So this is what this stage of the workflow looks like. On the left hand side you have the forensic copies of the Fulbright uh, US-UK Commission archive. So this is an institution that basically allows for UK and US students to study abroad. Um, these are some of the CDs and then on the right hand side you have the unique number allocated to them and the title of the disk, the original disk. What are some of the challenges of this part? So a digital object is not self-contained, Emmanuel already talked about this, but it describes relationships and dependencies within a computational system. Um, if you are isolating digital objects out to be file by file, you are not necessarily getting the entire ecosystem that those files evolved in. Um, it's not easy to distinguish between system-generated and user-generated files, especially when considering legacy content. In large collections, duplicates can be stored in disparate locations on the disk. These might be meaningful or they might not be meaningful. Whether or not to delete them, whether or not to remove them from the listing is up to the cataloger. But mailboxes and database pr files prevent, present particular challenges because they're not amenable to this process. If I have iTunes library, listed as a file, that doesn't tell you anything about what actually was being used inside the iTunes library of that depositor. These library files have their own process and own organizational logic. Um, and then, addition to this, contextual information is not actually stored in the data often, but on the physical packaging, on labels, things like that. And integrating these paper and digital data, metadata is difficult. So, 
Moving on to metadata inscription, we use Droid, which is um, the digital, um, I've forgotten the acronym now, digital recognition object, something like that. Anyway, created by the National Archives, it basically uses the Pronom database to analyze file extensions and tell you what program created those files um, and exports as a CSV. We then process this CSV with a Python script. So um, the CSV is uploaded uh, as um, formatted correctly for upload into our cataloging system, which is called IAMS. Um, there's some graphs and charts which show date, file type, and time distribution created. Um, there's access file lists which show all files belonging to a type which we can currently provide access in the reading room. Um, we produce a very basic size and content overview text file which we can make available to researchers which contains key statistics about the archive. And then there's an entry on an aggregate SQL database which can be queried to provide information about our collections as a whole. So how much have we collected over the past two years, three years, those kinds of questions. Um, so here's an example of those. So this is the size and content overview for the Virago archive. Um, it tells you the size, it tells you the date range. Interestingly, it, provide, it tells you the percentage of files available for access. So this just compares all of the extensions which we can currently provide access to and all of the extensions which we can't and gives you an idea of what percentage we could provide access to in this whole archive. For this one, it's quite low because it's quite old, but it's 12%. Um, this is really used for internal advocacy in the library to say that, listen, we're not doing well enough. We need more uh, people. We need more resource. We need to think about this. Uh, in different ways. Um, then all the different counters there, and then the bottom line of text is basically um, just telling any researcher who looks at this that it was automatically generated and that it might actually pres uh, have some incorrect stuff in it. Um, on the right hand side, we have a file type distribution chart which was taken from the Andrea Levy archive. So you can't actually see the dates on this, I've just realized, but um, you can see using this graph um, how the types of programs that writers have used have changed over time. So you can see the orange on the left-hand side is Quark Express, which is a very early um, word processor. This starts to kind of fizzle out by the mid-2000s and is replaced by Microsoft Word. Um, this is really good at the acquisition stage as well because it tells you what kind of migration pathways you might need to be looking for um, as you process the archive. So what are some of the challenges? IAMS, our cataloging system, is a bespoke software package. There was a vogue for this uh, back in the day in the British Library where we just said, our collections are so huge and so unlike anywhere else that we have to write our own software for absolutely everything, but then there's no resource to kind of maintain this software into the future, so you're stuck using things that feel like they're from the 1990s. Um, and that means that the Python code is only applicable to this specific system. Um, when we get our new system in place, that Python code will essentially become redundant um, and all will have to be reworked into fitting into that new system. Um, development of the code was completed as part of a project funded by the Institute of Coding in Birkbeck, University of London. That was basically, uh, they paid for a bunch of people from the British Library and the National Archives in the UK to go away and learn how to code, and this was one of the projects. Um, there's no money or resource in place to continue development of this, so what it is ends up being what it is. Um, and it still needs to be regularly updated, debugged, and maintained. And also, the other limitation, and the biggest one, is that only technical metadata is generated automatically. Free text descriptions still need to be created manually by human beings who have expertise, who are catalogers. Um, and so the last stage of the workflow um, is migration and access. So we use Adobe Acrobat Pro, and we turn all image and text-based files into PDFA. These access files then undergo full sensitivity review, making sure they're compliant with GDPR. We then upload these files into an FTP server, which is accessible via a dedicated terminal in the manuscripts reading room. And readers cross-reference these entities, these entries in our catalog with the server listing and call up collection items based on their description. So this is what it looks like. This is a catalog entry on the left-hand side, and then the user will find the equivalent file on the FTP server, and they will pull it up, and the PDFA will come up and look something like this, but it won't be redacted. Um, so what are the challenges? Migration makes digital objects into tra traditional archival objects. 
it takes things that were created in one environment and makes them into something representable in another environment, and that inherently involves loss. Migration to PDFA means that much of the collection can't, can't actually be migrated, so it really, creates, it really privileges literary creation. Those scientist archives that I mentioned earlier, if you get those early programming code that they wrote and make it into a PDFA, that might be useful to somebody, but it would be much more interesting to see those programs running in their native environment. Um, finding a migration pathway for some of this legacy software is often very time and resource intensive, um, and hardware and software dependencies are difficult to reconstruct without um, loss or corruption. Migration is foundational to this workflow, but it is a compromise. It, this workflow was developed thinking, how do we get this material in the hands of our researchers? It's not meant to be perfect, it's a compromise, and it always involves loss. And the thing that came out of the workshop that I mentioned earlier really is that dynamic, flexible search across collections is not possible with this. So a PDFA is a very flat document. You can't search across all of our collections and be like, oh, I can see patterns emerging across all of these different, or even within a collection. Literally all you can do is this thing that's analogous to um, calling up a, a, a manila folder of files, opening it up, reading it, putting it back, ordering something else. Email, I'll be very quick with email because this presentation is not about email, but as I said, the email collections are extracted, are isolated at the extracted capture stage of the workflow. Um, emails, as we all know, they're threaded, they're not amenable to this logic of deliverable units, they're increasingly media rich, they're often highly sensitive. We use EPAD, um, which we've talked about a bit today already, but it's free open source software developed by Stanford University Special Collections. Um, and we plan to make the redacted metadata available online through their shared discovery site too. And we found that the named entity recognition and natural language processing in EPAD help with the sensitivity review for access in the reading room, but they are not perfect, especially with personal archives. The idiosyncratic nature of how these creators make the content that pertains to their creative life means that it's very difficult to capture everything that might be sensitive. The example I use often is from an email archive where I was getting lots of hits in EPAD um, for drug use and I was confused by this so I investigated a little bit further and realized that it was highlighting every week this person was ordering their groceries online and ordering mushrooms and then they were there was this was getting a drugs hit so I had to go into the lexicon remove mushrooms and there's this kind of iterative process where you kind of remove things that might be remove things that might be too vague that they might, most of the time when we talk about mushrooms, we're talking about eating mushrooms, right? But sometimes we're not. <laughs> so <laughs> that's basically it. <laughs> so what does this all mean? The pace of technological change actually works against archivists working with legacy carriers. This is a broad theme. The technology industry is very concerned with the next new thing, not with preserving all of the old things for all time. Hybridity is here to stay, but archives, at least in the British Library, continue to be split according to format. We might not go into somebody's house and be surprised by a laptop computer anymore, but catalogers still email me when they get to box eight in an archive and say, I found some floppy disks, can I bring them to you? And there's no funding available to include cataloging those floppy disks within the original grant for cataloging. So that material stays hidden whilst the paper material goes to the reading room and gets used. What part of the story are researchers missing by losing out on this? Um, born digital archives are mostly dark archives. They present problems for public engagement, advocacy, and profile building. How can I, as a curator of this material, um, advocate for, create exhibitions around, build the profile of collections for which I'm not able to provide meaningful access? The scale and sensitivity of born digital archives makes full, full manual sensitivity review untenable. If you've got 100,000 files and they're all completely idiosyncratically organized, you cannot do a full manual sensitivity review of that material unless you have five, six, seven years of a full-time staff member, which we just don't have. And as I mentioned earlier, migration is inherently limited as an access strategy. So what should we be doing to be a bit more positive about it? Um, we really need to collaborate with colleagues in other sectors to pool knowledge and experience together. Um, 
oftentimes when you go into rooms like this, you might have a particular kind of skill set and another person might have a particular kind of skill set and you feel like you it's different you're kind of talking across each other because there's so many different skill sets within this area. Are you a humanities specialist who's just interested in knowing about a particular writer? Are you an archivist with an archivist background? Are you a computer scientist? Instead of thinking that we're talking across each other, we need to be able to pool, these, pool this knowledge and experience together. We really need to create workflows that allow non-technical specialists to work on hybrid collections without splitting collections according to format. Um, most people are never going to be enthusiastic about the techie stuff like we are. Um, catalogers come from a variety of different backgrounds too, and it's, job, it's the job of people like me to make that process as simple as possible for them. They shouldn't have any obstacle to opening up a a word processor document alongside a paper draft of the same novel and be able to compare them in order to build a catalog entry that treats it as one intellectual entity. At the moment, they do have that problem. Um, we, and when I say we, I mean curators, people who are collecting this kind of material, need to use our privileged position in relation to these collections so we have access to them, but we need to model research and increase public awareness of them. So if you see, as, if you as a curator see a way that these collections could be used, but you can't provide access to the research community, you need to model that kind of research in order that they can see that this is possible. And that's what I was trying to do with the network visualization stuff. Um, and we need to embrace tool-assisted approaches and be willing to critique them rigorously and offer alternatives to full archival access. So we need to listen to what the research community that we kind of create through model and research wants, and we need to be creative and open to how we approach providing alternative ways of access to them. Um, yeah. So in terms of shared knowledge and experience, the library works with a variety of coalitions and consortiums. I won't go into detail about what all of these different bodies do in the UK and internationally, but I'll share the slides and you can read if you haven't heard of any of them. Um, academic journals, these are more useful as links as well. Um, and presentations. All of this is about pooling knowledge and sharing, sharing expertise, sharing mistakes as well, and sharing problems. Um, in terms of scalable workflows, we so after automating the extraction and conversion of technical metadata, our focus is on enabling catalogers to create descriptive metadata at scale. So I've launched a training program through the Digital Scholarship Training Program at the library. This has been going on for like a decade and it teaches digital skills to staff members in the library. Um, you might not have something like this in your institution, but you can have something on a smaller scale where you kind of share the things you learn with staff members who are working on collection material in different ways. Um, and I want to really generate awareness of these collections. Some of these people might be interested enough to apply for a job if one comes up later down the line. You have to kind of create these, get the wheels rolling in the early stage, um, and then generate skills within the library too. Um, working with the technology departments, that's IT, to allow remote access to born digital archives for catalogers at their desks so that they don't have to come into the lab to look at this material on one terminal. They can tell me they're working on a specific collection. I can make that collection available to them through a shared drive and they can really treat the archive as one intellectual entity. They can have a wheelbarrow full of papers here and a hard drive full of papers here and they can see how they work together. Um, and so there's been three initial pilot collections for this, and then we, we meet with the Bourne Digital Catalog and Working Group, and we are really trying to build some evolving best practice through this group. It's only through people who know how to catalog archives working on this material and telling me what are the problems, what doesn't work, what level of description should I have, and discussing it with each other that we're going to get an evolving best practice. I can't come up with a workflow sitting in my office on my own. Um, and we're really hoping to build a knowledge base that lets us make accurate estimates about time and resource allocation for born digital cataloging. So the way things work at the moment is we might apply for external funding to catalog a particularly high profile collection. Um, and that external funding will cover a cataloger working on that material for a specific amount of time. But since born digital is quite experimental, I can't provide accurate estimates of how long it will take to catalog the born digital material. So therefore, the money is not allocated to the born digital material. And therefore, half of the archive, the paper, gets catalogued and half of it gets preserved, but not touched otherwise. 
If I can get more collections catalogued, more catalogers working on these collections, recording what they do as detailed as possible, I can make these kinds of um, I can make these kinds of proposal to funding bodies. So, in terms of model and research, on the left-hand side is an example from the uh, data analytics and network visualization for hybrid correspondence archives. So, I'll send the slides around, but the latest code usable code, not beautiful code, but usable code, is available on GitHub alongside a paper um, outlining what I did and what some of the issues were. Um, so this was with the Harold Pinter collection. It was really trying to analyze what makes analog correspondence and digital correspondence different from each other, um, what are some of the plus sides of, co of collecting digital correspondence, um, how can we get kind of location data out of digital correspondence, what metadata is actually inside an email that we can exploit and make kind of explorable. And then on the right hand side is an example from Ariel's PhD placement project on Writers Lives um, where she looked at the Andrea Levy archive and tried to find drafts of the novel Small Island which was actually published in 2004. And we realized at that point that there was actually drafts of this going back to 1991 and 1998. Um, so in terms of public engagement, we might not be able to provide lots and lots of access to this material, but I can talk about it. So um, we recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of the British Library. Um, and for that, the press team was interested in stories about digital collections. Um, and The Guardian came into the library to interview me about the Andrew Levy Bourne Digital Archive. And this article was produced and is already generating some kind of response. I'm getting lots of emails about it um, from computer scientists interested in what this material can do and things like that. Um, in the middle there, there's the uh, tweet from the Ask a Curator Day, um, where basically the British Library's press team allows a curator of a particular subject to take over the main Twitter feed for a whole day. Um, and they, they, may, they have like, I think they have three million followers or something. So you get a lot of questions and you get to kind of gauge the public mood about what these collections are, answer some of the common misconceptions. And obviously you can go and follow that link and see what some of those conversations were like too. And then on the right hand side, um, we have exhibition galleries. We're very lucky to have exhibition galleries in the British Library and an exhibitions team that's very into doing this kind of experimental work. So we're in conversations with them about um, implementing emulation as an exhibition experience just so that public who come into our galleries to see like Shakespeare's first folio or Jane Austen manuscripts or something like that are aware that for contemporary writers we have this really rich um, resource and also that you can you can experience it in a very self-guided and self-directed way um, so we're hoping to do that in the near future um, in terms of tool assisted approaches um, as I mentioned earlier, we used a Spectre Ultra digital forensics machine during appraisal to capture and locate sensitive data. Very limited to kind of health related content and financial information at this point, but still useful. Um, tools like EPAD with built in NLP capabilities can help to streamline sensitivity review with some caveats. Um, we use machine, le I use machine learning to, for very simple tasks such as extracting name entities from the email um, so that we can enrich the GDPR compliant metadata sheets with kind of um, titles of particular works of interest for Harold Pinter, for instance, or people that we knew were collaborators with him. Um, and we're very curious about the implementation of these algorithms for sensitivity review in particular, but as I mentioned, earlier with the mushroom example, we've really yet to see examples of these algorithms working well with personal digital archives. Um, and in terms of flexible access provision, um, I want to work on an on-demand access model where researchers get in touch directly and then we do arrangement, technical metadata extraction and migration uh, for the files of interest. And a lot of this public, public advocacy stuff is really linked to generating awareness in the research community so that they can get in contact with me, tell me what things they're interested in, and I can do this kind of ad hoc processing for them to make it available. Um, Data-driven research, so GDPR-compliant metadata sets for our collections with technical metadata, um, but also for network data for email collections. At this stage, research must be collaborative and experimental, and we really need to manage expectations. Um, it's not going to be the case that for contemporary material, we can make the kind of open data available that a lot of digital humanities scholars are interested in working with. But there is potential here to do very unique kinds of research. So as long as those conversations are kind of one-on-one, -on -one, 
and we are being collaborative with them, telling them what we can offer and telling them what the limitations are up front, I'm hoping to have sort of fruitful conversations in the future through that way. Um, and then there's bit level research. We are obviously very keen to do to work with researchers and depositors to encourage this kind of work in our collections. Um, it's very difficult because these are often living individuals or their heirs, and it involves um, it's basically bespoke research that involves deep relationships with depositors about what can and can't be used, what can and can't be published, and also non-disclosure agreements and things like that. Um, and I think that is the end of the presentation. So. Any questions? Sorry if that was quick as well. I have a tendency to talk quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Callum. Do we have any questions for Callum in the audience or the chat? Can you hear me? Is this on? Uh, we have a question. Uh, uh, do the British Library have some software to GP GDPR check out before uh, access is given to the material? No. Um, if that software existed, it would make mm. my <laughs> job a lot easier and it would make this, it would be the biggest solution ever imaginable. Um, because we're dealing with individuals, who have created this material over a span of their entire creative life. Um, it, I can't even imagine a rule-based approach that would work. Um, and I don't think machine learning algorithms are there yet. Um, another example I'll use from an email archive is that, so we're supposed to look for things that might um, cause significant damage to the reputation of named individuals in an archive. Um, so a lot of writers like to do gossip with each other about other writers. It's quite a catty group, at least in the UK it is. I don't know what it's like elsewhere. <laughs> so you often, in emails, you often get like, oh, so-and-so was at this reading, so-and-so was at this event, that kind of thing. And if, it, if it's not too, too scurrilous, then it can go. But that's a, that's a decision that the curator or the cataloger makes about access at that point. The problem for a software tool would be an example like I use, which is that um, one email contained none of that, but then I, when I looked into the attachments, there was a series of poems written, which contained sort of bits of literary gossip that if you were in the know, you could figure out who they were talking about potentially, but they were written in a poetic form. So how a software tool could have found that even within the text of an email, never mind the attachment, is very, very difficult. So no, we're not there yet, but it would be nice. More questions for Callum? Here's one. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, 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 just a question about uh, uh, the way to manage, uh, you manage uh, the duplicated uh, folder or file, because uh, um, I didn't understand well if you decide to uh, delete or maybe maintaining the path uh, where the duplicated files or folders are, um, if you can clarify it. So it depends, it, it's, it's kind of the same process that they would use with paper material. Right, in that, say for instance, you're in a particular file directory and you see that there's six of a particular file, you might just delete five of those files if they're identical and if the cataloger can tell they're identical, at least at the extracted capture stage with the preservation copy intact. Uh -huh. um, if, for instance, you see one file in one file directory that appears to be the same as another file in another file directory, you might leave those both there because that other file directory might tell you about some of the research that the writer was doing in that particular place. So the fact that it's in two places might actually tell you something about the working patterns. Um, but all of these decisions, one of the things that's good about Born Digital Archives that doesn't get talked about enough is that all of these decisions are reversible as long as you have a good preservation copy. So if you're cataloging a paper archive and you shuffle all the papers around and throw away a bunch of stuff, that's done. But like with a digital archive, that isn't the case. So we make these decisions um, with the best of our ability with access in mind but should we want to reverse that decision later, we can. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'd like to have a question about the search. You mentioned that it is not possible to search the whole collection, right? Mm -hmm. 
uh, and uh, I'm quite sure you know the uh, Friedrich Kittler archive where uh, 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 the curator was, the software um, engineer was uh, uh, Kramsky, who, who also published that they, they made um, a search engine which could index everything like the emulated uh, PCs and the DVDs and the CDs. So this is maybe a way as they did it. Hmm. I think it was not uh, available for everyone, but just the researchers because of the GDPR and the, mm. and the sensitive parts of the, uh, of the legacy. And the other question is that uh, everything is converted into PDF mm -hmm. of, for the researcher to be able to, at least in some format, uh, look at the material. But um, for the same uh, price, you can make also XMLs. Right, mm. and if you when the PDFs are created, not from the PDFs because that's a loss, but if you create XMLs, then it's quite easy to make a search for everything which are in previously only in PDFs. That all sounds very interesting. I would be interested to hear more about doing both of those things. Um, I think um, yes, I would. I think those kinds of things would demand quite a lot of research and resource um, and would probably be projects and would need to be kind of structured in a kind of project fashion and trying to establish those things as business as usual within an institution like the library where I'm collecting material, describing material, providing access to catalogues, that kind of thing would be quite difficult, I think. And that's what I was trying to get at in the presentation, which is like, we kind of know where we kind of know what access should look like, at least for kind of traditional archival researchers. Um, but kind of getting there is, is quite is quite difficult, and their expectations are constantly changing. And so you end up get, I yeah, you end up getting in a situation where you're playing catch up with ex with researcher expectations in a kind of hamster wheel way, if that makes sense. Sorry, but yeah, I'd be very interested in hearing more about about both of those things. Thank you. Um, I'm, my, my head is spinning around because I'm thinking about all those ways that we could use those work, uh, flow charts and everything that you, you showed us. Uh, but I would like to ask you more about the resources that you have. Um, you mentioned already that the storage space in London is extremely expensive, but for example, what kind of resources do you have? Uh, do, how many people are working with the born digital material? And is there in the workflow uh, some point that is very resource heavy, for example, the forensic part or something that needs a lot to function? Right. So. I work with I work with the Bourne Digital material alone, so I'm the only curator of this material, but that doesn't mean that I do everything myself. So with the digital forensics part of the workflow, I get help from the British Library's digital preservation department, with the technology department as well, so I, for different things I can rely on them. So for instance, if I have a particularly difficult batch of floppy disks that just aren't reading with the basic cryoflux, cryoflux software, I can send that box up to Yorkshire, which is in the north of England, and we have a digital preservation department there that can spend good amount of time working through that to try and get anything we can off it. Um, I guess I'm in charge of the sort of um, talking to depositors, all of that kind of relationship building stuff and also the kind of research side of things. In terms of description and metadata, um, I maintain the Python code. I wrote the Python code that does a lot of the uh, harvesting of technical metadata, but with the description, I try as much as possible to give that to catalogers who are working full time on specific collections. Not only because I don't have the time to do that, but also because they have the collection expertise. Nobody knows more about a collection than a cataloger who's spent a year and a half working inside that person's brain. And what looks like a bunch of random files to me might look completely like, um, might look completely logical to them. So I try and do that as much. But in terms of like training and things like that, we're lucky in the library that we have a good training and development system. So I rely on colleagues to kind of organize the administration for that, but I design the sessions. Um, 
And then in terms of research engagement as well, we have a research engagement team. Um, so if I'm interested in getting people in to do things like PhD placements, like the thing I mentioned there, uh, we, ha we yearly run PhD placements and I can submit proposals to that and then get somebody in to kind of work on that material in that way. So I'm a kind of node in a system where nobody else looks after Bone Digital material specifically, Bone Digital Archive material specifically, but I have a lot of resource external to me to rely on and a lot of expertise. So in a way it kind of mirrors what I was talking about earlier about um, pooling all of this resource together, all of this knowledge together. That's his question. More questions? We might have time for one or two still. I could ask you a bit about your backlogs. You, you have, like Oti said, a pretty impressive workflow here, but how, how are you coping with the growth of, of increasing increasing donations in this uh, digital born material? And are, are you are you up to scaling for for an ever increasing growth, or are you expecting increasing backlogs? Uh, at the moment, I expect an increase in backlogs. I'll say, but I think that's the position of basically every memory institution in the world. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. <laughs> I mean, I would worry about it, but it's a universal worry, not a worry particular to me. Um, I guess. At the moment, I try to um, prioritize smaller collections. So the, all of the collections that we do provide access to are kind of floppy disk CD collections. The personal computer collections, I think, are going to need a different approach. And at the moment, I'm kind of experimenting with what that approach might look like. So does it look like um, providing access to catalogers, building up estimates, making funding applications specifically for born digital material? Does it look like the ad hoc access that I mentioned? Does it look like um, data-driven research, emphasizing and that side of things. Um, so that's kind of an the personal computer side of things is an open question, but the workflow works well for smaller collections, I would say. All right, if there are no further questions, once again, thank you, Callum, so much for your presentation.